the Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, everybody. Um, I commence uh, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects uh, past to the elders past and present. I honour their young people who one day will take their place as custodians. Um, before we commence the hearing proper, I wish to acknowledge uh, that today is the 2019 International Day of People with Disability. The International Day of People with Disability is celebrated each year on the 3rd of December. The aim is to increase uh, public awareness and understanding of the rights of people with disability and to celebrate their achievements and contributions. The celebration uh, also seeks to increase awareness of the benefits to be derived from including people with disability in every aspect of political, social, economic and cultural life. Part of this awareness is the recognition that Australian society must strive for inclusion by removing the physical, social and attitudinal barriers that confront people with disability in their daily lives. The focus on inclusion is particularly significant for the work of this Commission. Uh, as we've heard, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities states that full participation and inclusion are fundamental aspects of the human rights of people with disability. The Commission's terms of reference explicitly recognise that promoting a more inclusive society is necessary to support the independence of people with disability and their right to live free from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. There are many events taking place around Australia to mark International Day of People with Disability. One such event is the National Awards for Disability Leadership, which will be broadcast via the internet, so I'm told, from 1 o'clock to 2.30pm today. The National Awards for Disability Leadership recognise and celebrate the extraordinary contribution and leadership shown by people with disability and their organisations in this country. Uh, we'll take the lunch break today in, in time to allow people uh, to be free between 1pm until 2.30pm so that anyone who wishes to follow the national awards can do so. I uh, want to congratulate all the finalists for their achievements and uh, I am sure I convey to them the good wishes of everyone who is in this room or, is who, or who is following this hearing. Uh, I shall now invite Commissioner McEwen to say a few words. Thank you, Chair. As the Chair has noted, today is International Day of People with Disability. The theme for this year's day is promoting the participation of persons with disabilities and their leadership. International Day of People with Disability is a day of global celebration and reflection. Our disabled brothers and sisters around the world are marking this day with us. This is a day to be proud, to acknowledge our, our achievements as a community and as individual leaders in all spheres of life. As disabled people, we are the experts in our lives. We are the ones who have experienced segregation we are the ones who have experienced social barriers and we are the ones who continue to experience violence, abuse, <coughs> neglect and exploitation in Australia. As experts in our lives, we will lead the change to ensure an inclusive society. Disabled leaders are everywhere. Disabled people lead community organisations, academic pursuits, businesses, artistic endeavours and scientific innovation. Sadly, however, disabled leaders are often not recognised nor given the same opportunities as their non-disabled peers to achieve their full potential. And they are significantly underrepresented at the highest levels of public office and organisation and in private enterprise. An inclusive society is one where disabled people are represented at all levels of leadership. 
it is important that our younger members of the disability community have a wide range of disabled role models to learn from as they develop and emerge as leaders themselves, as empowered leaders with a strong sense of autonomy, independence and commitment to equality. Disabled people must be able to participate in environments that are universally designed, inclusive and fully embrace their disability. These aspects are outlined in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The importance of leadership by and participation of disabled people in all aspects of our society cannot be emphasised enough. It is imperative for true inclusion. In closing, I pay tribute to all those disabled people who have gone before me, who through their determined and committed leadership have paved the path toward realising our human rights. I thank them for their tireless efforts and I say to them that I will do all I can to build on their achievement into the future. My congratulations to all the finalists for the National Award for Disability Leadership and I wish all involved in the award the, award the very best. Happy International Day of People with Disability. Thank you. Ms Eastman. Good morning, Commissioners, and good morning, everyone in the room today and also watching. On behalf of the Commission staff, that includes the Council, Solicitors, our very large research, policy and strategy team, we also acknowledge the International Day of People with Disability. We all feel honoured and privileged to be able to work with the Royal Commission to address these issues. And so I hope I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues, many of whom you don't see in this room, but are working very hard in our offices behind the scenes and around the country. So we also acknowledge our colleagues in the Royal Commission with disability, and we wish them a happy day as well. So may I turn to the business of today. Uh, today we change uh, our approach a little bit. Some people may be disappointed that there will be few people with visible disability appearing in the Royal Commission today, and that's certainly not intended. But what we want to do today is to start the, to ask the questions of why uh, violence, abuse occur, what do we need to be asking in terms of <coughs> developing policies and practices? And to that end, we thought that we would be assisted by talking to some of the academics with expertise in this area to help us set a framework in which we can understand the evidence that we heard yesterday, but also more importantly, the evidence that we're going to hear for the rest of the week. We will, throughout this week, have witnesses who have lived experience of disability coming to share their experiences with the Royal Commission and assisting us understand how we can better work to develop policies and practices to eliminate violence and abuse. So our three witnesses this morning, we start with Ilan Wiesel, to, who will deal with issues of history and deinstitutionalisation. Then we have Claire Spivakowski, who will speak to us about some of the practices in group homes, often described as practices to assist and care for people with disability, but in fact operate to perpetrate violence and abuse. And Sally Robinson will speak about uh, her research on developing safe strategies. The afternoon session, yeah, we turn our attention to the way in which the sector is uh, regulated in Victoria, and in particular, the experience of the Office of the Public Advocate, Colleen Pearce, and the work that she does in uh, assisting people with disability in decision-making in relation to their homes. Her evidence will examine her role and powers and uh, provide us with an overview of some important research and reports that she has undertaken recently. And our final session of the day will be a panel of two community visitors who will give us uh, a very direct and personal insight into the role and the importance of community visitors in working with people with disability in group homes. So I will now hand to Mr Andrew Fraser, who will take our first witness this morning. 
Thank you, Ms. Eastman. Mr. Fraser. Uh, the first witness is uh, Alain Beasel. Uh, Dr. Beasel, is that is that how you pronounce your name? Beasel. It's that's right. Ilan Beasel. Beasel. Yeah. There is someone else whose name is spelt the same as yours that's pronounced a little differently. Uh, yes, well, you may take the oath or affirmation as you wish, and if you just follow the instructions. Thank you. I solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give will be the whole truth. Sorry, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Dr. Beasel. Please sit down, and uh, Mr. Fraser will now ask you some questions. Thank you. Can you please tell the Commission your full name? Uh, Ilan Beasel. And you're a senior lecturer in urban geography at the School of Geography, University of Melbourne? Yes. You've held that role since 2016? Yes. Prior to that, you were a senior research fellow at the University of New South Wales at the City Futures Research Centre? Yes. You held that role between 2009 to 2016? Yes. What is your primary area of research? My primary area of research is in, in um, understanding the social geography of cities, and I'm particularly uh, interested in social inequalities in cities. And I've looked at aspects that create disadvantage uh, in urban areas. A particular focus in my research is uh, people with disability and questions that surround housing, institutionalization of people with disabilities and how it also relates to urban policy and housing policy. And in fact, you are currently leading a three-year study titled The Disability Inclusive City, examining adjustments made by mainstream housing, health, transport and community services to becoming more inclusive of people with intellectual disability. That's correct. And you have provided a statement to this commission dated 28 November 2019? Yes. You have a copy of that with you now? I do. And the contents of that statement are true? Correct, yes. And you've included in, your, in that statement your CV and what you've described as a short list of your publications at paragraphs 9 and 10? Yes. Uh, commissioners, that statement is at tab 66 of the tender bundle and includes annexures from tab 67 to 76. Thank you. I'd like to start by asking you some questions about the process of deinstitutionalisation that commenced in around the 1960s. Implicit in that concept of deinstitutionalisation is an institution. Can you please describe the concept of an institution? as it related to persons with disability prior to the 1960s? So since about the 17th century, uh, people with intellectual disability and psychosocial disabilities, amongst others, have been uh, institutionalised or housed uh, in, in large facilities, you know, or large-scale facilities from hundreds and sometimes thousands of people under the same roof. Those are those institutions uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, institutions are more places where uh, all aspects of the lives of, of the residents took place. They, they slept there, they had their, that's where they spent most hours of the day, all hours of the day. Um, there were uh, quite a strict hierarchy be between staff and residents and quite a tight, rigid schedule of activities that's determined by the institution. So how then do you describe, in that context, the process or the, the concept of deinstitutionalisation? Uh, deinstitutionalisation is uh, a movement that has started internationally around the 1960s uh, that will involve the closure and downsizing or redevelopment of institutions and a shift toward community based housing and support for people with disability. And the process first commenced in the 1960s in Europe and North America? That's right, in, in Europe, uh, North America, and then many, others, many other countries have followed, including Australia. And what were the factors that drove deinstitutionalisation as an international movement? There have been a few different factors. Uh, so deinstitutionalisation started in the 1960s and was in a way part of a broader civil rights movement. 
Uh, so the, the rise of a disability rights movement as part of the broader civil rights movements of the 1960s uh, was part of the drive for the institutionalization. There was mounting evidence of the abuse uh, and the, I guess, the neglect, restriction of individual uh, freedoms that was taking place in institutions uh, in various places. There were dozens of reports, inquiries, academic studies, um, and media reports on, on those conditions in institutions. Uh, and that led to the movement of the institutionalization. Uh, there was a new ideology that, uh, of normalization, a view that people with disability, including people with intellectual disability, uh, should experience the same standard of living and should have the, the same opportunities as uh, other members of the community. Uh, and community-based housing, uh, as opposed to institution, was seen as the pathway to, to normalization. Uh, there was, I think, the institutionalization was also part of broader, broader reforms uh, in the public sector uh, towards, uh, I guess, community-based provision of uh, human services in many other fields, such as aged care, uh, vocational services. And how did this movement towards deinstitutionalization manifest itself in Australia? So in Australia, there was a first wave of deinstitutionalization uh, in the 1960s and 70s, but that did not involve full closures of institutions, rather more uh, downsizing and quite kind of piecemeal relocation of residents. And that was the first wave. And then in the second wave of the institutionalization, uh, uh, in the 1980s, we've started to see closures and, and, and more significant redevelopments of uh, institutions. That was driven by the Disability Services Act in 1986, a piece of uh, federal legislation uh, which recognized uh, people with disabilities' right for community-based uh, living and support. Uh, also, I guess, national policies such as the National Disability Agreement, uh, then known as the Commonwealth State and Territory Disability Agreement. And that articulated a broad uh, policy framework for deinstitutionalization at a national level. Now, you've referred to some initiatives at the national level. What about at the state level? So the, the national level policies were quite broad, but there wasn't really, they were not really attached to significant funding. Uh, so it really left states and territories to their own devices in uh, developing their own deinstitutionalization policies. Uh, so I guess each state followed a different trajectory and timeline of deinstitutionalization. Um, um, in terms of that process here, what were some of the historical barriers to implementing the process in Australia? It's been a very slow and haphazard um, movement in Australia. Uh, so I've talked about it starting in the 1960s and we, we, there are still institutions uh, out there. Um, some of the barriers include, I guess, first political barriers. Uh, the institutionalization policies were supported both by um, liberal and labor governments in different states, uh, but we've seen different governments, uh, I guess, overturning decisions to close institutions by previous governments or uh, not really prolonging their own uh, commitments to close institutions. Other barriers included uh, labor relations, uh, worker unions that have often, often voiced concerns about uh, potentially negative implications of closures on, on staff in institutions and issues surrounding uh, redeployment of, of staff. Um, and, and then another issue was uh, particularly families of some residents in institutions uh, who opposed the closure of the institutions where their relative had lived, uh, primarily driven by concerns about the adequacy of community-based community -based, uh, housing and support for their relative. Uh, so those were the issues that were being negotiated by different governments in different states and have uh, significantly, I think, um, slowed down the progress. Can we just go back one step? Can I just ask you, how, how important was the Richmond report? 
Uh, it was quite important in New South Wales. Uh, it has been, I think, quite a significant driver of the institutionalisation in New South Wales. And that was 1983? That was in 1983. And um, it led to um, quite significant, um, I guess, policies that followed on of the report. But I, I can't tell you off the top of my head the exact timeline in, in that period. Okay, thank you. In terms of the process or the, the progress in Australia, uh, how would you describe describe that? Perhaps starting with uh, New South Wales. Sorry, could you repeat the, the question? The, 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 the progress of deinstitutionalisation. So here I'm looking at paragraph 25 of your statement. Yes. So the most of the large scale state run institutions in Australia have been closed by now. Uh, but in New South Wales, uh, despite commitments by the government to, to close all its institutions, we still have um, institutions, uh, Canangra, Stockton Centre and Tamari Lodge, which are still operating. They are, they are much smaller than they used to be. There are fewer, fewer residents there. Uh, they are expected to be closed by uh, next year. Uh, at paragraph 26 of your statement, you refer to uh, some statistics from the AIHW. What is the AIHW? The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Uh, and what's the, um, the statistic that you've stated there, paragraph 26? Uh, so the statistic refers to 5,000 people who live in supported accommodation facilities. Uh, the AIHW uh, records uh, the data on uh, different disability services, including accommodation services. They don't currently, they used to have um, a measure of the number of people living in institutions, but they've changed their terminology, which in fact makes it uh, harder to, to follow uh, the numbers of people living. Uh, so they, they have one criteria for people living in domestic size uh, facilities, uh, which I understand as being uh, group homes and they have larger supported accommodation facilities, uh, which uh, I guess is a broader category. So it's hard to tell how many of these people live in institutions or other types of facilities that are bigger than group homes, but not necessarily large scale institutions. Now, paragraph 27 of your statement, you refer to uh, one of the most controversial aspects of deinstitutionalization. Can you tell the commission what your research has shown to have been the, the various, if you, could, if you like, controversial aspects of the process? So, I mean, one of the first things was uh, the closure of institutions. And as I mentioned, there was opposition from some, um, um, from different directions. But another question was where institutions were closed or redeveloped, the question was what would be the type of housing that would replace them? Uh, so in most cases, People were rehoused in group homes, uh, but in some cases, other facilities were built that were larger than group homes. Uh, in some cases, for 10 people rather than, and usually in a group home, you'll have five or six people, uh, but there'll be facilities for 10 and sometimes 20 people. Or in some cases, you'd have something like a cluster of group homes, so a few different group homes uh, on the same side or in very close proximity. And can you give an example of, of that occurring? And I'm referring to paragraph 28 of your statement. So Q Cottages was uh, the largest institution in Victoria. It was um, redeveloped, closed down in 2008. Uh, all the residents were rehoused uh, in group homes. Uh, the majority of them were rehoused in group homes that were dispersed all over the state. Um, but uh, about 100 residents uh, were rehoused in about 20 group homes. Uh, within Q on the site where the institution used to be, they built a new residential neighborhood. Uh, and those, initially those group homes were meant to be dispersed within the neighborhoods, but I understand that they were very much clustered together in, in the same area within the neighborhood. And that, there was quite a, a substantial debate around the planning of the closure and about the planning of the uh, rehousing uh, of residents where carer groups uh, very much uh, wanted to just to have as many residents stay in queue, 
uh, for very good reasons. Some of them are to keep the connection to the area where they've lived for a long time, to keep those networks between residents and between carer groups and staff. Uh, but many disability rights organizations have objected the development of such a cluster on the basis that this will reproduce some of the same problems that existed in the institution. Uh, what were some of the other uh, consequences of deinstitutionalization? I'm referring here to paragraph 30 of your statement. Um, there's, what we are seeing is that parallel to deinstitutionalization, there, there's an increase, and quite a dramatic increase, in the number of people with disability who are homeless or incarcerated in prisons. Now, it's hard to draw a direct line between deinstitutionalization and, and that it's not the same people who have left institutions and are now in prison or, uh, or homeless. But the, the point is that we've not seen the sufficient uh, provision of community-based housing to meet uh, the needs of all people with disability. Dr. Beazel, um, it's readily, I think, understandable as to why there was a move away from institutions having regard to the kinds of abuse and so forth in the large institutions. What was the rationale for the movement towards group homes as distinct from some other alternative to institutions? Or was there any other alternative to institutions? The, the, the main rationale for group homes, uh, I, I would describe as economies of scale. So it, it was very expensive to provide one-on-one uh, -on -one support for every resident uh, to live on their own. Uh, so grouping five or six residents in a group home uh, provided some economies of scale in providing support. So you'd have a roster of staff uh, providing care for five people. So you'd only need one or two staff members at every time uh, rather than, than five. And at this stage, group homes were uh, financed by state governments for the most part? For the most part, yes. That's right. Is it implicit in what you say that the ideal would be one-to-one? One, um, one, one place of accommodation for one person? Is that, is that implicit or is that uh, just a comparison for cost purposes? I think the ideal is where people have a choice about where they, where they house and, and with who they live. And uh, I don't believe most people would have chosen to live in group homes, but uh, I think that sh they should have been asked, and uh, they haven't. Uh, there was no choice for people about where they're going to be rehoused. There was no choice for people about who they live with in a group home. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that governments were the original funders or providers has that changed over time? Over time, uh, government stayed the funders, uh, but over time there has been a, a shift where quite a substantial uh, number of group homes were delivered by non-government organization, by disability services providers, which are non-government. But it was still funded by state governments. Now, in your statement, just to locate you, um, at paragraph 36, you refer to some of the advantages and disadvantages with the group home model. Can you explain to the Commission what your research has shown to be some of the key advantages and disadvantages? So overall, I think the, the, the evidence internationally and in Australia suggests that quality in group homes is better than the institutions they replaced. So it's not necessarily um, a move for the worse, but there are some serious problems and issues with the group home uh, system. Uh, for the first start, for the first, uh, my first point is that uh, outcomes for residents were quite inconsistent across different group homes. Uh, so it depends on a whole lot of factors and variables from the quality of support staff, their training, the mix of residents, the compatibility between residents, uh, and, and other factors related to the location of the, serv of the, of the group home. Uh, as I, I just mentioned earlier, I think the question of choice had been a real significant issue. Group home residents have very little, if any, choice about where they live, with whom they live, um, and that goes against the Convention on Rights and People with Disability that specifies uh, explicitly that people with disability should have the opportunity to choose their place of residence and where and with whom they live on an equal basis with others. Um, 
an issue with the group house. There was not enough of it. There was unmet demand for, uh, for, for accommodation and support. Uh, so that resulted in quite long waiting list uh, to enter group homes, and that was the only option available. So even if people did not want group homes, that would have been the only option to receive some kind of accommodation and support. Um, but to be offered a placement, you'd have to demonstrate extreme uh, level of urgency, high levels of need for a group home. Um, so many, very often, people would only be offered a placement after the death or illness of a, of a carer or work when carers have relinquished care for a person with disability. That created a crisis-driven approach to how vacancies were allocated uh, and, and, and created problems, including the incompatibility between residents who just did not choose to live with one another and really did not get along together. You've referred to the incompatibility between residents. Uh, what about incompat incompatibility or issues with, with service providers? And I'm referring you here to paragraph 39 of your statement. There's, um, so just like, uh, in, in the same way that residents had no choice about co-residents, they had no choice about their support staff. They, they basically had to take it or leave it if they were offered a placement. Um, and once they enter a group home, the, the support provider the, is both their landlord, they run the home in which they live, uh, but they're also their support provider. They're supposed to provide uh, support services for people living in group homes. Uh, and that creates a power dynamic that is, is, is very much against uh, the residents. So imagine if you live in your own home and you bring in someone to, to provide you support services. It, it gives you some control over the situation. But if you live in a house that's owned or managed by the support provider and they're also your support providers, they have quite significant control over your life. Uh, so that was a major issue. And if you wanted to leave, you lose both your home and your support. Uh, so, again, it, it disempowers people with disability living in group homes. Are you speaking of a situation where instead of the state running the group homes, it's now a private service provider? Is that, is that what you're directing? Your not necessarily. To? Not necessarily. It could be uh, provided by the state or by a non-government organisation. But for, uh, from a resident's perspective, the, the house they live in, in is owned by their service provider. Right. Uh, they do, would not necessarily see distinction in terms of who owns the house and who runs, manages the house and who provides their support services. So housing and support were, were linked together uh, and that I think created uh, a disempowering situation for residents and, and empower support services. Do we know what proportion of group homes are owned or run by the state or one of the states compared with private service providers? I do not have that data. Uh, you've referred um, in your statement to some of the consequences for uh, persons with intellectual disability with challenging behaviours in the group home environment and just to locate you on looking at uh, paragraph 42, 43 of your statement. Are you able to expand upon some of the, the consequences that can arise for such people? Yes, so challenging behaviours are, are where people with intellectual disability primarily, I guess, express, present behaviours that are considered disruptive or even violent towards staff or other uh, co-residents. Uh, the literature understands challenging behaviour, the academic literature understands it as an expression of frustration where people have very little control over their, their, their lives, have no other ways of communicating their frustration, their needs are not being met. Um, in group homes, people with challenging behaviours uh, would live with other residents and that might create issues for those other, other residents in terms of uh, having to um, to live with, with such behaviours that can be quite disruptive and violent. Uh, some organisations have tried to avoid that by um, moving people with, I guess, clustering or taking a few different people with considered to have challenging behaviours and putting them in the same group home. And that would create a, a group home where uh, practices of support staff would be quite restrictive uh, because they will have a house with three or four or five people with uh, quite high needs 
and uh, they'll often use quite restrictive practices to try to control that. Um, the, the final thing I'll, I'll ask you, um, given your expertise and research in this, in this area, is what would you like to see come out of the Royal Commission in terms of access to housing for people with disability? Uh, I guess my, my interest, my research interest is also about housing and affordable housing. Uh, we know that with the NDIS there is an anticipated unmet need in, in affordable housing for about 100,000 people with disability who will be NDIS participants. And I think that there is no uh, national or state level policy to address that scale of unmet need. So what I would like to see from the Royal Commission is, is a very strong push uh, to, to, for governments to come up with plans to address unmet need and, and to provide a, a, su a supply of housing that is affordable for people with disability, that gives them choice about where they live, that is suitable for people in terms of their design, the management of their homes, uh, that is well located, that is not segregated, uh, if some people would choose to, li to live in group homes, I mean, that, that should be an option that is provided, but other people should, be have, should have many other housing options and housing and support options. Uh, I think the NDIS went a long way in, in addressing some of the unmet need in, in support services and, and you know, doubling the funding for support services, but we have not gone uh, much further in addressing housing unmet need, and I'd like to see that area being... Um, developed. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I have no further questions for Dr. Wiesel. Uh, yes. Commissioner McEwen has a question. Thank, thank you. You talked earlier about the disempowering of residents and group homes. What do you think needs to be done for people with disability to be able to exercise their rights as tenants? Thank you. <laughs> I think the NDIS will change some aspects of the group home system. So the group home system will be regulated under the Specialist Disability Accommodation, also known as SDA uh, framework. And one of the things that would change is that a, per a person would have the SDA funding in their NDIS plan. So that funding will not be attached to the group home, it would be attached to the person in their plan which, at least in theory, it means that people will have more choice about moving out of a, a group home where they're unhappy and using the funding to enter another group home. Of course, that would depend on availability of sufficient supply of SDA accommodation. Uh, if there's not uh, supply, if there's nothing to choose from, having the funding is not going to be particularly helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a variation on the questions that have been asked? You're obviously familiar with the United Nations Convention and in particular Article 19. What would the system look like if Article 19 were to be fully implemented? What would have to be done? I know you've expressed views about meeting unmet need, but then that requires um, translation into workable practices and policies. So how, what would it look like? We would need... So you're, you're now the dictator, so you can determine right. the allocation <laughs> of resources. We would need a program, a national program, right. to build supply of affordable housing. And I'm talking at the scale of 100,000 new homes. And this is just for NDIS participants, uh, excluding many other people with disability who are not NDIS participants and live in uh, substandard housing or living private rental, experiencing affordability stress, which means paying uh, half their income on, 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 their, on their rent. Uh, so a national plan to build uh, 100,000 at least uh, new homes that are affordable, where people pay no more than 25% of their income on the rent uh, is, is the first step. And uh, I don't see any such policy being proposed. And have you done a costing of that policy? I have not. I'm not an economist, uh, but the NDIS is an expensive um, policy, and we've managed to get it through. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much.
Mr. Fraser, is there anything else that uh, you would like to ask Dr. Beasel? No, no. Thank you, Dr. Beasel. Dr. Thank Beasel, you. thank you very much for your attendance and thank you for the work that has gone that you've done and that has gone into your statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Eastman, yes. Commission, please. The next witness is Dr. Claire Spivakovsky. Dr. Spivakovsky, I'm sure it's been explained. You may take the oath or affirmation as you wish. Thank you. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Please sit down. And thank you for your attendance today and for your statement. Um, who will be taking? I oh, will. You will. Oh. Uh, so, commissioners, a, a copy of the statement is at tab 41 in the bundle. And Dr. Spivakovsky has also provided the Royal Commission with a copy of her CV and her publications. And so those are the documents from tab 42 to tab 53. All right, Dr. Spivakovsky, you are Claire Spivakovsky. I am indeed. And you currently hold the position of Senior Lecturer in Criminology at the University of Melbourne. That is correct. You've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission dated 26. November 2019. That is correct. Do you have a copy with you? In I the... do indeed. And you've had a chance to read over the statement? I have, yes. No corrections or changes to any part? No. And the contents are true and correct? That is true. Right. Uh, I, what I want to start with is, if you can start right at the beginning, because the work that you do in looking at violence and abuse for people with disability, and we're going to talk about group homes, mm -hmm. is something that you want to explain in a way that we can understand it. And I think there's an example that you've got, sure. which is a good example to sort of help start off the discussion that we're about to have. Sure, so um, my research, broadly speaking, uh, is around the governance of the lives of people with disability, particularly as that relates to law. So I'm interested in um, what are the sort of social and cultural and institutional processes um, that, uh, in essence, dictate the sorts of lives that people with disability can have uh, under law and um, what some of the problems are within that. And so a lot of my work has actually been around um, what are termed restrictive practices that Alain started to mention in his um, evidence before. And restrictive practices, um, if you're not familiar with them, uh, particularly in Victoria, they, they sort of sit under four main categories. So we have uh, what's called chemical restraints um, that can be used uh, in terms of, this is medication that is not, often we think of medication and we think, oh, okay, someone has uh, a cold, we'll get them some Sudafed, we'll treat them in these ways. This is medication that is used for the purposes of controlling someone's behaviour or controlling other elements of their lives. So you might want to think instead about um, medication that is used to make people a little bit more docile, so antipsychotic uh, medication, um, or medication that might be used to, in essence, chemically castrate someone, lower their libido, make them have a lack of choice in that way. Um, there's mechanical restraints, so being uh, restrained with uh, straps and other sorts of uh, mechanisms to chairs, for example, to beds. There's physical restraint, using someone's body against someone else's body. Uh, and there is seclusion as well. So not very nice stuff at all. Um, so can I just pause you there? Because of course I think you can. What, one of the issues that you've looked at in your research is, and we'll come and talk about restraint in a little mm. bit more detail in a moment, is that if we compare how we might look at the use of restraints mm -hmm. for persons who are not identified as people with disability, I think you've you use that to yes. help understand the impact of the yes. way in which restraints might have an impact on people with disability. So sorry, it's a little bit of no, a long-winded no. way. <laughs> but the example I think you gave yes. was an example from a different Royal Commission. Right. Yes. And, and uh, the way you put it is, very helpful. So rather than me say that, can you help the sure. Royal Commissioners just have an understanding about how you've looked at, say, the example in the other Royal Commission to sure. the issues we, we're going to talk about in a moment? Yeah. Um, so I guess the reason that I was giving the context of 
restrictive practices is that these are things that um, many disability advocates uh, and activists, scholars, including myself, would call uh, disability-specific lawful violence. They are forms of violence and abuse, and if they happened in any other context or in relation to any other population, we would be outraged and we would be doing something about this. And the example um, that I often speak about uh, with students, for example, to help them understand this, because I think we often look at these things and we think, oh, okay, well, but they're happening in a group home or they're happening and the law says that this is part of what happens to people with disabilities, so it must be okay, it must be treatment. But if we think about um, the example of uh, Dylan Voller in um, the Northern Territory and we think about the Dondale uh, Juvenile Justice Centre and the terrible footage that was shown of him strapped in a chair with a split hood over his head and the outrage that that sparked within the general public and the instant Royal Commission we got and call for Royal Commission the next day. If we could have that kind of outrage about that which can occur in group homes and which the law says is okay to occur in group homes that can occur on regular bases, why is it that we can't see this in the same way? Why do we not ask the same questions? And and for me, I can't, I can't answer that for you. So to me, when we give someone medication against their will, forcefully against their will, when we strap them down, when we hold them down, when we lock them in rooms, that is violence and abuse. And, and that's what I'm interested in understanding why we persist on doing that and why we can't call it out for what it is. And, and part of this is that uh, the use of those restraints you've examined in your research are lawful in Correct. the sense that they're practices that might be permissible because there may be a relevant court order or tribunal order that permits a person to be treated in that way. That is correct, yeah. And, and they sit within our Victorian Disability Act. You can do these things. Um, you can get more extreme versions of them too if you think about um, one of the things that I've studied is supervised treatment orders, or sorry, supervised treatment orders that we have here in Victoria, which are, I would say is a more extreme version uh, of this. But in essence, a supervised treatment order, if you're not familiar with them, uh, are orders that only apply to people with intellectual disability, only apply to people with intellectual disability who reside within uh, residential services, so group homes, uh, only apply to people with intellectual disability who are said to have a pattern of violent or dangerous behaviour, but there's no specific explanation for that. And if that can be proven uh, before the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, with its lesser burden of proof, if you can prove that this is the case, you can ask for one of these orders to be made for up to 12 months. That means that a person can have uh, in essence, a uh, version of chemical castration. So giving people quite significant amount uh, of chemicals to change their behaviour. They can be locked within either their room or within the service provider's premises. And if they are to go out, they require two to one supervision. Uh, and we do these things and we say it is okay because it sits in law, but it is, it is not okay. This is what I find very troubling. Can you give an example of the of a case uh, where such an order was made, the behaviour or circumstances that were said to justify such an order? Uh, sure, so um, I so I can give you a, um, oh, I don't know what you want to call it, an, an amalgamation, a general set of cases as opposed to a specific case. Uh, so, um, and these are publicly accessible. If you go to the Victoria Civil Administrative Tribunal's uh, website, you will be able to download some of the cases that are heard before that. So usually the ways that these um, supervised treatment orders or STOs end up being applied is if a person has uh, come out of prison and we um, service providers decide that that constitutes a pattern of violent or dangerous behaviour and that they have concerns that that pattern will be continued within the group home setting and so uh, they <coughs> seek um, one of these orders. And what I would say to that is we have a range of post-sentence supervision orders uh, that in Victoria that have incredibly high burdens of proof because we understand it in any other context to be a breach of someone's human rights, that someone has served their time in prison and are now in the community and should not be held under any further regard. 
but we don't seem to apply that same standard to people with disability. This instead uh, acts as an opportunity, if you like, or a, a another way that they can be held under this law because this sits in our Disability Act, not under our criminal law. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, I think so. Uh, but does that mean that, as a, in effect, as a condition for admission to some kind of residential facility, the person coming out of jail, for example, m might be subject to an order of the kind that you've described? It's not clear if it would be a direct condition, um, but it is uh, all of the cases that I have reviewed, um, sorry, not all of the cases, the majority of the cases that I have reviewed, uh, the evidence that is given before or presented before the Victorian Civil Administrative Tribunal when they have to make the case around violence, uh, a pattern of violent or dangerous behaviour when they try to make that case. Uh, they refer to the person coming out of prison within the last 12 months. So my understanding would be the person is released from prison, they enter into a uh, residential service or a group home, and then at that point, I believe they would still need to demonstrate some level of agitation. Uh, then they, um, one of these supervised treatment orders are sought and the grounds often in which they are permitted is that they have previously come out of prison and that that demonstrates a pattern of violent or dangerous behaviour. Thank you. Right, so I just want to take you to paragraph 11 of your statement where you describe four forms of restraint. Yes. And this is part of the subject of your research. So the first is the chemical restraint, and I think you were describing that earlier. So that's the use of tranquilizers and other psychotropic medication uh, that is used for the purpose of subduing a person. And you say here controlling unwanted behaviour. Yeah. Uh, is that a euphemism? <laughs> What's that <laughs> referring to? Uh, so that primarily refers to, um, well, it, what, what gets called, also uh, euphemistically, as uh, challenging behaviour or behaviours of concern. And that can uh, include a wide range of things. Often um, chemical uh, restraints are used in relation to more violent behaviour or any form of um, sexual behaviour. Not necessarily, I would add, um, as some interview participants have explained to me, not necessarily problematic sexual behaviour, but whether or not people want to have, um, people and service providers would want uh, residents to be sexually active, to uh, um, have their own choices in how they uh, engage in sexual activity. It can also be used in that context uh, to limit that, but that relates to uh, forms of abuse. In so, so in terms of the use of chemical restraints, mm -hmm. would the Royal Commission be right in understanding that that requires the intervention of medical practitioner? What do you mean by intervention? So if there was to be the use of a chemical con uh, restraint, say mm -hmm. in a group home, it wouldn't just be that somebody in the group home, a support worker said, look, this is not good, we might administer some medication. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be the, the case that there has to be the intervention or involvement of a medical practitioner, both in terms of prescribing and making a decision about whether it's for therapeutic or other use? Mm. So an um, authorised program officer is uh, usually the person who makes some of the decisions around this. They take it, uh, they make a case um, for which the, uh, what was previously called the Office of the Senior Practitioner um, would oversee whether or not this is to be done. There can be instances where um, what's called PRN medication where uh, um, a, a form of chemical restraint can be used at an immediate moment of time mm. if there is a suggestion that it needs to be used at that time and it cannot be wait, uh, waited for. Usually, though, it's based on an understanding um, of, uh, I guess, a persistent pattern of behaviour that they are seeking some form of um, response to. Okay. This, the second area that you identify is what you describe as mechanical restraint. So mm -hmm. that's the use of mechanical mm -hmm. devices such as wrist or mm -hmm. leg restraints that prevent, restrict or subdue a person's movement. 
Uh, can you give us an example about how that would work in practice and the context in which a mechanical restraint would be used? So mechanical restraints, my understanding is that they are um, less uh, frequently used um, than many of our other forms of uh, restrictive practices and because they are, in my opinion, quite barbaric, as are many of the other ones as well, but um, they are less frequently used. They, the context in which they uh, might be used, um, not in the context of group homes, but actually in the context of uh, education, where I've also done research, um, you may recall different instances uh, that have uh, been spoken about in the inquiry into violence, abuse and neglect around uh, young, young people being uh, strapped to chairs, for example, if you're fidgety or agitated or are perceived to be likely to injure yourself or others or to damage property. That's the context in which it might be used. Right. The next one was physical restraint, and you've said in your statement that's mm -hmm. using a staff member's body to physically restrict the movement of a person with disability. Mm. So is that a type of restraint that might be used to deal with a, a particular situation <coughs> as it arises, or is this Correct. something that is more common in terms of the way in which a staff member might interact with a resident with disability? So, based on my research and what has been said to me in the interviews that I've conducted, uh, my understanding of it is more that it is um, at, to do with particular incidents as they arise. And incidents is too uh, strong a language. The, the example that I can think of is um, uh, an interviewee relaying to me a um, resident of a group home who didn't want to be put on a bus to be taken to the day service and was uh, loudly exclaiming that they did not want to go and was um, physically restrained and physically carried, dragged down the hallway to be put uh, onto the bus to go to this. So it's in, in those circum um, immediate circumstances usually. The final example uh, that you describe is seclusion. So that's a, a form of sole confinement of a person within a locked room or part of the premises. Yes. Yeah. So uh, is that used as a, a restraint or is that something that intersects with punishment? Have you researched that relationship yeah. between <laughs> restraint and punishment? Yeah. Uh, so seclusion is a funny one. Um, it's a very slippery slope is what I would say around seclusion. Uh, I think most uh, places would say that they will not seclude residents, but I'm not sure what you call it when someone is locked in their room against their will, and I'm not sure what you call it when someone says they want to go outside and they are not allowed to. Um, so it, it has a very strict technical um, legal purpose, and I suspect most people will be able to say that they adhere to that. But this comes back to this point about, I think we need to appreciate what are the actions and, and uh, <coughs> interventions that are taking place and look at them in their actual state rather than, um, and understand them for being, locking someone back, holding someone back, restraining them, doing these things, as opposed to just simply understanding the pure technical has it breached a specific element of law as well. Mm -hmm. So now I want to turn to the research that you've undertaken in restrictive practices and the everyday practice and regulation of disability group homes. And at paragraph 13 of your statement, you talk about your research focusing on three uh, relationships, uh, three yeah. areas. So the first, which you've described in paragraph 14, is the exploring underlying assumptions about risk, disability, and normality. Mm. And can you assist us a little bit more in explaining what the nature of this research involves and what your research has discovered? Uh, so this is, I guess, comes back to the um, point that I was uh, making before about what we understand things like restrictive practices and other forms of intervention with people with disability in group homes, what we understand them to be. Because often they are based on 
assumptions about what is seen as um, so-called risky behaviour, risk to others, risk to selves, dangerous behaviour, and also assumptions about how everyone supposedly should be behaving in a rather uniform way within a home environment. And so these are the sorts of assumptions that allow us to have things like supervised treatment orders being created, allow us to have restrictive practices sit in our Disability Act because we believe that some people with disability will require this form of intervention and that belief rests on an assumption of risk or of dangerousness or some inherent thing to disability that makes it uncontrollable in some way. And that's, I think, what often stops us from seeing these things as actually being incredibly problematic. The second area of your research has considered the relationship between the use of restrictive practices and other forms of violence against people with disability. And re reviewing your publications and your work, this seems to be a very central feature mm -hmm. of looking at the intersection between our criminal law mm -hmm. framework and the way in which restrictive practices uh, operate in group homes. So can you tell us a little bit more about this area of your research and again, what you've found in the work that you've undertaken? Sure, so as you said, this sort of looking at this um, intersection between the use of restrictive practices and these other forms uh, of violence. And um, I guess there's a range of different examples I can give for you there. The, the, um, the first thing that I would say is that the, there are multiple problems with restrictive practices, but one of the things that I find very problematic about them is that they, um, I guess, sit on this broader continuum of control and containment and what is allowed to be done to people with disability that then, I guess, blurs the line between uh, when violence is permissible more broadly. So if you think, um, I guess, about a person with disability where restrictive practices is allowed to be used against them and on Every morning of the week, um, someone is allowed to give them medication against their will. But also on maybe, let's say, um, every afternoon of the week, uh, a staff member is supposed to help them go to the toilet or help them dress themselves or help them clean themselves. And these are all things that we have regulations or laws uh, and governance procedures that say, it is okay that someone is doing this to you. It is okay that someone is touching your body. It is okay that you can be uh, undressed or someone might be present in the room while you're doing this or someone may physically pick you up that these are then the same circumstances where somehow three hours later if someone does that to you and there weren't these sorts of guidelines around it, we want to say that that's abuse and violence because it is. But what I'm trying to come around to in a very roundabout way and not necessarily clearly is that if these, how do you tell the difference? How, if you are being told on a daily basis that it is okay that this staff member is in a room with you while you're getting undressed, or it's okay for the staff member to help you get dressed, or it's okay for the staff member to put you on the toilet, um, and it's okay for the staff member to hang around in the toilet while you're there, and it's okay if, for the staff member to hold you back if you're aggravated, and it's okay for the staff member to give you medication against your will. How do you, how do we, uh, I guess, so sort of how, how, how do, do you we, know that yes. what, what is what, the line? What's happening yes. in day-to-day -day life yes. crosses the line? Yes, it's something to that's be, not okay. And to be conduct that's not okay. Yes. And, and so how, how, you how has your forward? research examined that, and where are the challenges for people with disability <coughs> to know and understand that concept of crossing the line? Yeah. So. Um, one of the projects where this was the most apparent is a project that I conducted um, in partnership with People Disability Australia, uh, who were representing Dis Disabled People's Organisation Australia. Uh, this was when I was based at Monash University with colleagues at Monash University as well. And this was uh, looking at violence against women with disability. Um, and it was looking both in and outside of group home settings as well. Uh, and I guess it, part of it is this problem of where is that line? How do people get to say it? But the other part of it is, uh, 
I guess that there isn't any opportunities for it to be said. So I think about the sort of research that I have conducted over the years and it is, um, as academics, we often uh, get frustrated with how little data there is around violence against people with disability. Why, um, is, why sorry to interrupt you, of course. why is there so little <laughs> data yeah. around uh, recording violence and abuse of people with disability? So, so there's a, a range of reasons for that. Um, part of it is to do with what our government collects, so the Australian Bureau of Statistics and where it sort of draws the line in terms of um, collecting data. So uh, as Alain was talking about us before, about whether or not people within group homes are actually uh, able to speak, sometimes there is a decision that a person is unable to speak for themselves um, and so someone else will stand in for them. But then it seems that the questions around violence are not asked because it's not coming directly from the person. So we, we lack a lot of quantitative data. I'm a qualitative researcher, which means that I go in and do interviews. There's more to qualitative research than that, but I think that's the easiest way of saying it. Um, and so with qualitative research, the particular sorts of barriers that I usually face is that um, so I speak to service providers, I speak to uh, people in government positions, I speak to a lot of very generous uh, disability advocates and activists, and I speak with people with disability as well, obviously. Um, and particularly around these issues to do with violence and abuse, um, people don't want to speak. And when I say people, what I'm talking about actually is, is service providers often do not want to give access um, to speak with people residing within their residence, uh, to speak to them about violence and abuse. And often the reason that is given is that there is concern that this will be re-traumatising um, and too difficult or that the person will not understand uh, the questions that are being asked or the circumstances in which the violence occurred. And I will say that that there is good reason to have some of these concerns. It is incredibly uh, traumatic to speak about some of these things and we should respect and understand that and I think this commission does. And we should appreciate that we need to give people full informed consent before we ask them difficult questions. But at the same time, when we have a range of protocols around how to do that, when we appreciate how to provide people with support, often it seems that the barriers for actually gaining access are about concerns to do with, with other things, in part about, I would say, protection of the service themselves. But also, coming back to the thing that I'm often interested in, assumptions about people with disability and assumptions that the person with disability will not know what happened to them, will not be able to speak, will not be able to understand these very limiting assumptions about the actual capabilities of people with disability. Th these are difficulties you're describing with uh, qualitative research. Correct. Yeah. Um, quantitative research is a rather different sort of undertaking. Yes. And I imagine that there are very substantial methodological difficulties in a body like the Australian Bureau of Statistics yes. getting accurate information on the extent of abuse and violence within, say, group homes or other forms of accommodation. Is that a fair yes. observation? What can this commission do to overcome that problem? But if you're not a quantitative researcher, <laughs> perhaps I'm asking the wrong person. Yes, thank you for saying that. I was trying to find a nice way to say, as a non-quantitative researcher, I'm not sure that I'm the, the best place no, to okay. answer well, that particular enough. question. Yeah. 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 Okay. The, the third area of your research you've set out in paragraph 16, and that concerns the mm -hmm. relationship between the use of restrictive practices and broader organisational concerns. So. Can you help us a little bit on this issue sure. and what your research has found? This is the uh, interface with occupational health and safety, mm. workplace rules, the way in which organisations are structured. Is that yes. the, the focus of the research? Yeah. So what has your research found in this area? Sure. So again, this is research based on qualitative uh, interviews with service providers, with disability advocates, uh, with um, I guess other stakeholders in the space, including government organisations and other representative bodies. So what some of my research has shown is 
you know, when I ask people about restrictive practices and why they exist and why sort of um, control might occur in group home settings, the answers that I often get and what the research suggests is that an element of this has to do with organisational concerns about their own reputational risk. So as a um, interviewee sort of put it to me, this kind of concern of, well, what will happen to us if someone gets out and does something terrible? How will that reflect on us? This, what sort of funding will the organisation continue to receive? And so it seems that there is then this kind of implicit and potentially explicit pressure um, that is then placed on staff to manage these situations in which potentially something could go awry within the community and it could be um, seen that the organisation was uh, not, well, not living up to expectations, if you want to say it that way. So that there is then this pressure, as um, staff have reported to me as well, that to sort of manage these situations, because it's not just the organisational risk then that's of concern, but that it becomes staff's jobs that are of concern. That there is a feeling that if something was to go wrong, that then it would be who was responsible on that day for that person and that their job might cease. And so this then creates this kind of situation where if you're kind of, um, I guess, being very controlling around the environments in which people can have access to the broader community, what they do in that broader community, and you're then bringing it closer and closer inside of the home or you're restricting the amount of time that might be spent out, you then have situations where people quite rightly are very frustrated uh, with that. People with disability are quite rightly frustrated. And what then seems to happen is this, um, I guess, complicated uh, deferral to um, workers' occupational health and safety concerns. So I appreciate the concerns that workers have about their occupational health and safety, but it seems to be a one versus the other that if workers are concerned about their occupational health and safety because they are being told that they are now staying in a place with someone who is so risky they can't be let outside, supposedly, that they then use that as reason to control other behaviours, either through application for restrictive practices, through using um, medication that they shouldn't necessarily be using in that context, or through other forms of controlling uh, where people go so that they then are not feeling like they are in threat. And there seems to be a justification that this very blurred line around the edges of when restrictive practices can be used is more palatable because it is said to be about protecting the occupational health and safety concerns of the workers. And I find that very problematic. It shouldn't be one versus the other. You should be able to have environments where people can work safely and where people can actually enjoy their lives. Um, Commissioners, they're, they're the questions that I wanted to ask Dr Spivakovsky. You could appreciate that we're really just uh, opening up these questions and she has provided all of her articles and uh, research papers which uh, explore some of these issues in some detail. Uh, so unless the Commissioners have any further questions, that completes all the matters that I wanted to explore, but I do preface that as this is only the start of an investigation which um, we may need to explore further into the future. Thank you. In your view, how would you describe the use of restrictive practices, particularly in Victoria? Uh, do you think it's epidemic or do you think it is it needs to be addressed, and how serious would you describe it? <coughs> Pardon me. I think a lot of the literature is saying at the moment that it is um, being used at a concerning rate, uh, that it is something that has to be addressed, particularly in this state as well, that we tend to be potentially a little bit more risk management minded, and that that's where it seems to come into place. Um, how we address it, I think, is in part by addressing group homes. To me, these things go hand in hand. 
um, in part because that's the nature of the legislation, that restrictive practices are only meant to be used in particular contexts, or, sorry, they do get used in other contexts, but they're only legislated to be used in particular contexts, including group homes. But restrictive practices are not necessary when you don't have behaviours of concern. Behaviours of concern, as we've heard before, and as also people spoke about yesterday, I think about um, the man who gave evidence in the morning who spoke about his, um, that, you know, maybe some people think that he is difficult. We are all difficult, or at least I am anyway. <laughs> we can all be difficult. And when we live in circumstances with other people, we can be frustrated and we can sometimes be aggressive and we can say things that we may not mean. We can do all sorts of different stuff. But no one watches us all the time and decides that that's an indication that our behaviour is somehow uncontrollable or risky. And no one looks at that as evidence that that is something bigger to do supposedly with a disability. So I think if you want to get rid of restrictive practices, which I wish we would, that it is also about getting rid of group homes and the nature in which they both create circumstances that are so incredibly frustrating that this is the kind of behaviour anyone, I suspect, would um, live up to in those places. But also that they are the nature of those homes, that those behaviours are documented and watched and used to build cases of evidence that they are somehow something more than just frustration with a unpalatable situation. I take it that you would accept that uh, you cannot get rid of group homes overnight. So on any view, whatever you replace group homes with would be a reasonably <coughs> long process. Mm -hmm. While they exist, would you accept that there will be cases of, of violent behaviour and so forth? How are they to be addressed in the absence of some capacity to impose Restraint. I think everybody would agree yeah. that restraints are not a good thing, mm. but what do you do to cope with a problem of that kind? I think that's a very difficult question. <laughs> that's uh, why I asked. Yeah, I <laughs> um, as an academic, I'm, I'm much better at identifying problems than I am at coming up with solutions, I'd say. I used to be an academic. <laughs> so, I think that it's really about the investment then in the environment, in understanding how to change that environment so that people actually have proper choice and control while it persists and that, that the time period in which it persists should be shortened so significantly like that, that it has to actually be a priority to disestablish to group homes, to disestablish uh, restrictive practices, not just say that it is something we are aiming for, that we have created frameworks for, that we need to move quickly on these things, but that if we have to have something in the interim, then it should be based on the understanding of where these things come from. And if they are about um, quite understandable frustration with environment and with circumstances, then it's about addressing those environments and those circumstances as they are, and then continuing to just remove them entirely. It, it seemed <coughs> to me that one of the factors you were saying was responsible for this was the disempowerment of, in fact, that also relates to Dr. Wiesel's evidence, that disempowerment of residents leads to frustration, mm. leads to acting out, least restrictive practices, more disempowerment. Is, is that an accurate analysis yes. of, of how it seems your research goes? Yes, that it almost becomes a self-fulfilling cycle often. Um, and and that, um, that the disempowerment, as you say, sort of leads to the frustration, leads to restrictive practices. And then the frustration that restrictive practices are in place then acts as a justification that those practices should be there because there's an idea then that the person doesn't know what they're talking about or wouldn't be in control of their behaviour if they say that they don't want to be uh, forcibly dealt with in the way that they are. That absolutely this is sort of self-fulfilling, which is why I would say chop it in half and get rid of it altogether because I'm not sure that you can... Uh, 
just fix components of it. It's too tight a circle. But I, I appreciate that you can't change the world overnight. I would just say, can we not change it faster than we are at the moment? Did you have a Thank you very much, Dr. Svetlakovsky, for coming and giving evidence and for your research, which we shall look at very closely. In fact, Commissioner Atkinson, I'm sure, is going to read all of your publications in detail. <laughs> thank you very right, much. Thank you very much. Should That's we now have a short adjournment? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Now, let us make it. It's now 20 past 11, perhaps 20 minutes. OK, thank we'll you. come back in 20 minutes. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Yes, thank you, Commissioners. The next witness is <coughs> Professor Sally Robinson, and Mr. Harding is taking Professor Robinson. Yes. Professor Robinson, if you wouldn't mind taking the oath or affirmation as you wish. Thank you. <coughs> I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <coughs> Please sit down, and Mr. Harding will ask you some questions. Uh, Commissioners, um, a statement of Professor Robinson is at tab 126 of the tender bundle, together with a number of uh, papers that she has prepared and wishes the Commission to have regard to. In addition, Professor Robinson has provided the Commission with a book uh, entitled Preventing the Emotional Abuse and Neglect of People with Intellectual Disability, which is not yet in the tender bundle, but will um, find its way there. I think we each have copies of that. Oh, thank you. Um, Professor Robinson, is your name Professor uh, Sally Antoinette Robinson? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, are you a Professor of Disability and Community Inclusion? That's right. Um, and you're based at Flinders University, yes? Yes, I am. Um, and before then, um, you, were, uh, you worked for the Centre for Children and Young People at Southern Cross University as an Associate Professor? That's right. Um, as, and leader of the Disability Research Program there? I did. Um, and Professor Robinson, have you prepared a statement for this commission? Yes, I have. Have you read it recently? Uh, yes, I have. yes, I have. Several times. <laughs> so, uh, on that basis, you feel confident that it's true and correct? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, Professor Robinson, uh, you, you describe uh, the research that you undertake uh, in paragraph 9 of your statement. Perhaps if you could elaborate further for the Commission about that research. Uh, thank you. The, the research that I do is really um, about privileging the perspectives of people with disability, uh, particularly people with intellectual disability. Uh, I'm really interested in understanding what matters to people who um, are the kind of people who aren't going to appear here before you. Uh, and uh, I particularly want to know what is um, important to them about living a good and flourishing life and what gets in the way of that. Uh, I'm interested in um, preventing abuse, um, but more than that, I'm interested in promoting personal safety and how we can have um, high expectations for people with disability to have the same sorts of productive, positive, flourishing lives that people without disability have. And uh, really what gets in the way of that um, for, for people at an individual level, but also in terms of the, the systems uh, and the wider structures that impact on that. Um, and in paragraphs, from paragraphs 12 on you state, you describe uh, the experience of abuse uh, from a variety, that people with disabilities experience abuse from a variety of sources. Um, and you describe that as the multi-dimensional nature of abuse. Perhaps if you can tell the Commission what that means. Mm, thanks. Um, across multiple projects, um, I've found it very helpful to, to draw on this multi-dimensional framework, which really is a, a 
series of concentric circles. Uh, and what's very important is the person at the, the centre. Um, and that's the, the person and how they understand themselves uh, and their relationships. So about, about people's own identity. Uh, and then at moving outward, the, the, the relationships between the, the people who are closely involved. So in the context we're interested in today, the working relationships that are between staff, uh, staff and families, uh, managers, um, the, the people who are involved in the, the, the group home and the, the service context that people are a part of. But then more broadly, the role of organisations and systems and what that, that has to, to, um, to, to play. And then the influence of wider social and cultural factors. <coughs> So thinking about abuse and neglect in this way, I think, is really helpful because it, it highlights that group homes themselves are important, they're critically important, but um, they're not the only factor that's coming into play. They're, they're, there's a whole lot of things that are, are, that are moving in and out and affecting um, people with disability in particular, but, but also the people who are a part of their lives. So there's three aspects, if you like, the personal, the relational, the systemic, mm -hmm. and you say to you the group home is part of that dynamic, but there are other elements to it. That's right. Um, now, you give an example uh, in your paper about uh, a person you know, Jan, which you say highlights <coughs> these aspects. Can you perhaps um, tell the Commissioner about that example yeah, further? thank you. Um, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to speak about Jan's life because Jan was really important to me and I think that um, if she were still alive, Jan would be front and centre um, at the Royal Commission. Um, Jan and two other people, Kim and Robert, um, were really important um, in leading my work and directing my work and today on the International Day I think their leadership really should be acknowledged. Um, I first met Jan Daisley when I was her lecturer at uni. Uh, she, um, uh, and over time we grew to know each other very well. And um, I was her friend and colleague and I was also her advocate for um, a long time uh, until her recent death. And uh, Jan had two uni degrees. Uh, she had a, an undergraduate degree and then a master's degree. And she wrote a three volume autobiography as well about her life. Um, she had an extraordinary life. She was the president of a national advocacy organisation and she had a wide circle of friends. She was a very well-loved woman. She had a, a very uh, loving family as well. She was a very brave and resilient and exceptionally strong-willed person. Um, she was also a person who had very high and complex support needs. Uh, she was blind, she had quadriplegia, she had a speech impairment. Uh, she was reliant on other people for all of her physical support needs. Um, when she acquired her disability in her 20s, Jan went into a large uh, institution um, and she lived there for quite a long time. Uh, she then moved to a group home and then finally in the last year of her life she moved into her own home, which was always her goal. Um, she um, uh, said herself, I'll just read her words, uh, that she contributed to in Shut In, which was a, a web campaign about deinstitutionalisation. She said, it's well known and documented that large residential facilities housing people with disability are breeding grounds for abuse. And much of this abuse is caused by archaic rules introduced by bureaucracy and the biophysical and medical models of disability which prevail in institutions. It is time governments stopped passing the buck and injected adequate resources and expertise into fulfilling their promise to close institutions. Let's be real about change and give people with disability, the shut-ins, the chance of living a quality life in the community. While group homes are not perfect, they're an enormous improvement on what people with disability, both young and old, have had to put up with in institutions. I moved out of an institution over 17 years ago and have no regrets. Sometimes things can be difficult, but that's life no matter where you are. The whole 20 years that I knew Jan though, she made continued complaints about the quality of care that she received. When she lived in the group home, she had bones broken, skin torn, money stolen, multiple physical abuses. So when she said life wasn't perfect, she was gilding the lily a bit there. And when she complained, she was told that she was difficult and that she was demanding by managers of the group home. The needs and preferences of workers were prioritised over her needs. She was expected to be patient, to wait, 
to work with a steady stream of new staff and agency staff who didn't understand her communication, uh, to wait for more resources to trickle down. Uh, eventually, Jan moved into her own unit and that alleviated some of the worst problems uh, in the last year of her life. And I think Jan's story speaks to some really important things. Her situation shares many of the features that are common to people who've participated in um, several of our research projects. And that's about that multi-dimensional nature of abuse that I was talking about. It's also about the normalisation of violence, abuse and neglect over time and the lack of authority that people with disability have over their own lives in services. The opportunities and the barriers that people with disability have to develop and use safety strategies when they don't feel safe in their home environments and the systemic origin of practices that are experienced in very personal ways. Now, you just you mentioned safety strategies, which is an aspect of the research that you report upon in your statement. Um, and um, you deal with that subject uh, in paragraph, or from paragraph 25, by reference to um, uh, a graphical image. Uh, can you tell the Commission what that image depicts about the safety strategies that you're speaking about? Mm. Um, we um, have done some research where we worked with people with disability um, across two projects, one was with children with disability, one was with adults with disability, um, about what they do to be safe and what they do when they don't feel safe. Um, the, the graphic there is a model that um, was developed by people with disability about how they understand safety. Um, and there are four um, elements to the model for people who can't see it um, that are about being physically safe, being emotionally safe, um, feeling capable, oh, thank you, uh, and, uh, and having your access needs met. So the, the thing that I think that is really important that comes out of this work is this idea that people don't have ideas about what to do to keep themselves safe is wrong. People have some uh, really good strategies, some great ideas about what helps them to be safe. Uh, you can see there that around being physically safe, people had some um, ideas that what they needed to be safe was to have a safe place to be, to be out of danger, to stick together, to not be mistreated. Um, around being emotionally safe, um, that people, um, this, this was very important to people, um, that uh, it was about being known, um, being, uh, having, having trusted relationships, people you could count on, um, uh, having a feeling of comfort, being known and understood, being respected, feeling protected. Um, in terms of feeling capable, it wasn't so much that people wanted to be uh, independent and feel that they could stand alone, but they wanted to feel that they were supported, that they were listened to, that they were able to influence, that they had influence over what happened in their lives. And in terms of having access needs, um, that people, um, it was very important to people that um, access needs were thought about more broadly, that it wasn't just about having a ramp or having a hearing loop, although those things were important, but it was about feeling well met and welcome, that you were wanted, you were expected. Um, somebody in the research said this, put this very nicely when he said, social perceptions bleed into accessibility. If people perceive a wheelchair or crutches as an inconvenience, then you're not going to feel like you want to be there and therefore the place becomes inaccessible to you. Uh, well, Professor, uh, were there ways based on the research that people gave effect to these strategies in their lives? Yes, there were. Um, there were also a lot of tensions. I don't want to present this as it was a straightforward thing because yes. it wasn't. Um, and people are really diverse. I really don't want to... Um, sort of put this out uh, as like it was a really straightforward thing. People had strategies, they implemented their strategies and it happened. There were heaps of tensions and difficulties around this. Um, it's also really important, I think, to acknowledge that people come with the histories. Um, so people who had um, uh, safe backgrounds, people who didn't have um, abuse histories, um, uh, had different strategies and different levels of confidence in being able to use their safety strategies. But lots of people who have been involved in our research didn't have that experience. They already had experienced abuse, um, including, sadly, young people. 
um, and that affected their capacity to um, uh, put, to identify things that would help them to be safe and to implement them. So one of the things that I found the saddest about this research that we've done was that some of the strategies that people talked about were things like keeping a low profile, dressing in nondescript ways, crossing the road when you, somebody was coming towards you, um, uh, being hyper vigilant about keeping the door locked all the time, a set of strategies that effectively make you less visible in the world. And for young people to do that, is really sad because it's about diminishing who you are in the world and making yourself less visible. Um, young people shouldn't be feeling that. Yes. Uh, and, and what it does, it keeps you safe from some levels of harassment, but it also makes you more uh, vulnerable to predatory abuse as well at the same time. And you say in paragraph 28 that the management strategies, presumably the strategies utilised by the people you were speaking to, those with disabilities, uh, for keeping safe was subtle and often involved negotiation and compromise. Now, can you explain to the Commission what you mean by negotiation and compromise in that context? Because um, a lot of people were... Uh involved quite heavily with service systems. Um, they weren't on a level playing field. Uh, and so um, the sort of negotiation and compromise that, that people had to make was um, those sorts of things that I just talked about. So uh, the, the kinds of things that they had to negotiate around were um, about giving away some of their own um, capacity to be in the world, I guess, as I, I just talked about. Um, uh, and doing things that made them um, less likely to attract the attention of staff who they thought about as cranky or, um, uh, I'm not expressing it very well. Uh, so what? these are about strategies not only when out in the community, mm. but actually when at home. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. In, in that sense, just picking up on the Commissioner's question, um, we, when you talk about negotiation and compromise, you're talking about actions the person themselves took to control their situation in the group home or outside the group home. Is that right? Based yes, on right. what they perceive to be risks that they might evade if they took these Yes. This cause yeah. of action. What, what you're describing are, are strategies that uh, people within group homes, for example, have had to develop in order to cope with perceptions of danger. Yes, that's right. In perceptions that shouldn't exist in the first place because the danger shouldn't yes. exist. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand whether this is these strategies you're describing are universal, um, or were they strategies that people who had been subjected to abuse previously or were part of a particular kind of uh, accommodation developed? Uh, how, how widespread were these strategies? Um, they weren't universal. Uh, so the, um, perhaps I wasn't very clear earlier um, when I said that um, people who had uh, more trauma backgrounds were more likely to use those kinds of strategies and people who had um, safer, um, more family-focused backgrounds uh, were less likely to use those sorts of strategies. Um, so you know, people were bringing their own backgrounds with them. Um, sorry, I might have interrupted. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all, Commissioner. Um, in, in a, just on that subject, um, um, I think you say in your statement that trauma can be cumulative. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you're referring to when you're speaking about those who come from uh, more traumatic backgrounds and how they deal with the, how they apply these strategies? Um, the, the concept of accumulating abuse is featured um, very strongly in in. Uh, my research uh, across multiple projects. Um, it first of all came up um, uh, very strongly in my PhD work, which was about emotional and psychological abuse of people who live in residential services. A lot of those people had um, experience of living in group homes. What was really striking about this was that um, this, 
the service systems in which people lived uh, seem to have no capacity to recognise the accumulating chronic abuses that people experienced. They were very live uh, in the minds of people who I interviewed. Um, of the in the PhD work, I um, spent um, an extended period of time with nine people, uh, and there were over 300 incidents of abuse across those nine people. Uh, but there were, the service system had be, really no capacity to recognise the accumulating nature um, of those abuses in the lives of those people. Um, the, the system is designed to um, recognise and respond to abuse that's already happened on an incident by incident basis, um, based on the, the recognition of sort of more high level harms that have to re reach a benchmark. Um, of, of injury, uh, and but what, when you talk to people with disability themselves, the things that really stick with them, and we know this from our own lives, you know what it's like if someone gives you the stink eye on the train, it sticks with you. Um, uh, and so if that's part of your everyday life, those things stick and they accumulate and they grow and they stay with you. Those sorts of microaggressions and chronic abuses that we think of as small scale, but they're actually not small scale. Um, those things really matter. Can you tell us a little bit more about the PhD research? Yeah, the, sure. the nine uh, people you mentioned, mm -hmm. were they all in one institution or were they no. scattered? What sort of institutions? No. And when you say 300 instances of abuse, can you tell us what, how you defined abuse for that purpose? Um, yes, uh, I can talk about this work all day. So. <laughs> um, a shorter period will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, the nine people had pathways in and out of all different kinds of, of services. Um, they had lived in private boarding houses, group homes, large institutions, family homes, um, uh, innovative small scale um, uh, individualised service environments, um, and they had experienced um, emotional and psychological abuse and neglect across all of those settings. Um, the way that I defined abuse was um, consistent with the, um, the policy definitions um, at, at the time. Um, the, abuses that, that people had um, experienced, range, there were a range of um, abuses that meant another, a, a set of other benchmarks for physical and sexual abuses and other kinds of abuse as well. The 300 abuses were around psychological and emotional abuse, um, but there was, there's an, another catalogue of abuses that are tabled in there as well that, that aren't part of that, that number. Uh, the, um, the kinds of um, harms that people found particularly distressing were around the things that are around being um, ignored, around their, their needs for care diminished or, or um, marginalised by, by care workers, um, around having um, their, um, their, their needs um, dismissed, uh, particularly when they complained. Uh, the, the sorts of, there, there were um, some standout um, uh, memories that people had uh, about things like um, uh, a time when um, one person had been accidentally left behind um, at a, this was a, a person with high support needs, um, and she'd been left behind um, at a, um, a, a, they'd been out for, for the day, um, and the workers had left her behind um, and not realised until the police brought her back to the facility where she was living. Um, the, the, it was a large institution and the doctor refused to come to see her till the next day because they'd knocked off for the day. Uh, so the, the this sort of disregard of, of care, so those sorts of um, high level in, incidents. But others as well that were um, uh, equally f um, felt um, by, by people to be just as emotionally damaging to them around things like uh, somebody had bought meat for their Christmas dinner and they'd gone without in order to buy the meat and a worker um, took it home without their permission to cook it and then didn't bring it back and said, oh, it went slimy and I, and I threw it out for my dogs. And he went without his Christmas dinner that year um, because of the actions of that worker. 
Um, other things that I observed when I was interviewing people, um, somebody who had what was meant to be um, a, um, an innovative um, consumer-led uh, accommodation set up, who was at great pains to tell me that he was in charge of the, the hiring and firing of staff. Um, and I was there for three hours and that staff member didn't get off the phone that whole time. Um, and um, if that was what he was doing in front of me, um, I really wondered what he was doing when there was nobody there. Uh, so those sorts of, you know, the, the, those things that constitute a fabric of disregard for people. Thank you. Um, and in your statement, you say in paragraph, you, you, well, maybe if I withdraw that, uh, in paragraph 33 of your statement, you speak about the importance of alliances. And in paragraph 44, you also use the phrase, residents are different to citizens. Uh, how does that relate to what you've just told the Commission about the uh, importance of the relationships between um, people with disability and group homes and staff? Well, again, I would emphasise that there was a, there's a great range of people who were involved in our studies. Um, but the, um, the concept of alliance, I think, is really interesting because uh, it's a bit more subtle than the idea of people either being in control or mm. needing support. Uh, the idea of alliance is that um, people might need assistance for something, but they still... Um, uh, that, that what they wanted was to maximise the level of control that they had and for support workers to, um, to join them in a spirit of um, providing assistance that was um, collaborative, not controlling. Um, so some of the strategies that, that young people... Uh, the, the strategies that young people talked about that were really... Um, it was interesting the way that they, they differentiated them, I think. They talked about things that they could do themselves, uh, which were about building connections and some um, skill development things um, and help-seeking things. But then things that they wanted other people to do, and I think that, that builds this concept of alliance quite nicely, um, where young people um, particularly talked about wanting um, people to take action when something goes wrong. Um, and lots of people talked about that, actually. Just do something the idea of doing something, um, but not taking over as well. Uh, so, so be consultative about it. Um, uh, and having uh, understanding and responding to people's specific context and be realizing that what is safe for one person is not necessarily safe for another person. Um, uh, and changing the environment so that people feel welcome and included and so that they're less personally responsible for keeping themselves safe, uh, setting up cultures that are, that are safer. Um, for example. Um, in terms of how residents are different from citizens, um, I think this goes to the question um, of identity and what happens to the identity of people who are dominated by services. The, um, the, the way that, that systems respond to the experience of chronic abuse and neglect that I've just been talking about uh, in, in ways that, that, that lack adequate concern or that are overly, overly procedural or um, system oriented sets up expectations about the ways that um, people who are in accommodation services are expected to behave. Um, what they can know and what can be demanded of them and who they're answerable to. Uh, and so the, the, the concept of being a, a, a that there's damage that's done to, to people's identity by that. Um, people are being categorised as somehow fit for treatment. I think Claire talked about this in, uh, um, in a very articulate way, um, uh, that people are, are categorised um, as somehow fit for treatment that's not acceptable for other people. 
Um, and in service environments, care is commodified, um, and this objectifies people as, as people who, as residents, who've got a, a set of needs that need to be met. And that's, to a certain level, dehumanising of people. And when people are dehumanised that way, then um, the, the usual constraints on abuse and violence are, um, are weakened. Uh, and I think in the case of being a resident, um, then residents are expected to be compliant. Um, they're expected to not know real, very much about their right to complain or to know very much about violence uh, and abuse and neglect or to understand it. Um, and um, indeed, I think a lot of staff don't recognise it themselves either um, in terms of its more subtle forms or its systemic forms. Um, they're expected to endure it as, um, as routine parts of service provision. Um, and they're answerable to any staff member who might walk through the door. Um, anybody who they don't know. Um, we heard yesterday from uh, one of the parents who gave evidence about the number of casual staff who their daughter had, um, had um, worked with. Uh, and um, their, her daughter was answerable to any one of those people, um, benign or not. Um, and so residents are subject to policies and procedures that govern their lives in ways that citizens are not. Uh, and then is the contrast to that uh, what you then go on to describe from paragraph 47 as the rights-based approach, the human rights-based approach, and is it the remedy for what you're describing as the systemic problems that you've uh, research has identified? Well, I'm a bit wary about finding a remedy. Um, <laughs> I think um, we've got a very complex, very wicked problem here. Uh, we wouldn't have a whole Royal Commission if there was a simple answer. Um, and I think I, I, was, I, was, I was absolutely delighted to be asked to speak to you uh, and to prepare a statement for you, but I was also worried about preparing a statement about group homes. Um, because I think we've been so quick to, um, to build a model um, and then to dismiss a model and add another model and dismiss one and add another one and to, to sort of bolt on a solution and think, this is the next one, this will fix it. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think group homes are the solution, but I don't think throwing them all out is going to fix it either. Um, I mean, uh, can I say to you, I worry about if people are living by themselves with carers coming in, that they might be extremely vulnerable to abuse because there'd be no one to observe it, I agree. no one to report on it. So that's one of the concerns that's been growing in me. I agree with you. So really the problem is about dignity, respect and attitudinal change, partly, isn't it? Yes, I, yeah, I agree, yeah. Um, I mean, it, and I think that's one of the things that makes it such a wicked problem. We, we can't force people to live together, that's not right. Mm. Um, but we can't isolate people either, mm. so we can't force people to live separately either. Mm. Uh, so um, the, I think we need to come from a, a new vantage point. We've got lots of evidence about what constitutes a good life for people. Um, and we've got an increasing body of evidence now about what constitutes a terrible quality of life. Um, so to, to come from the evidence um, about um, the things that help people to have a flourishing life seems to me to be a really good place to start. Uh, the idea that um, removing abuse is going to create a good life that, um, that, that's only half of the story. Um, we need to create something in the space that's left um, by removing the conditions that are going to be abusive. Mm. Uh, so, I, and I think those things, um, certainly from the perspective of the people with disability mm. who we've talked with in our research, those things are very relationally driven. Um, and there's a tension there because relationships are also a risk. Um, uh, but, but um, there are safeguards that you can put around the quality of relationships, um, but, but solid, um, continuing, um, purposeful relationships come up again and again and again mm. uh, from the perspective of people with disability as protective. One of the lessons uh, 
of law reform, at least that I learned from law reform, is that if you ask the wrong questions, you're bound to get the wrong answers. But if you ask the right questions, you've got a fighting chance of getting the right answer. There is a natural human tendency to look towards relatively simple solutions to very complex problems. Uh, sometimes that's known in the political sphere as populism. Um, but sometimes problems that are very complex require multifaceted and complex solutions that may only be feasible over a period of time. What I rather get from your analysis is that you reject the notion of a simple solution by, for example, we've moved from institutions to group homes, now let's find another solution that substitutes for group homes. And what is required is a multi-dimensional approach that allows the transformation to recognition of dignity, respect, autonomy. Mm -hmm. And that is something that's going to be fairly difficult and complex to achieve, but it has to be, if that's the right question, how you achieve that, and that question has to be answered. Have I got it sort of semi-right? I would love that. <laughs> yeah, that's the question. <laughs> um, yes, um, that, that is, I think, the question that we need to wrestle with. Um, and some of the elements of that multidimensional approach, one might have thought, um, and this is not a criticism, one might have thought are fairly obvious. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things that bedevils our education system is the undervaluation of teachers. Um, mm -hmm. The teachers aren't sufficiently valued for the extraordinarily important work that they do. My impression, and it's only impression thus far, is that people who work in this sector may be undervalued as well. And maybe there are issues relating to training and pay and uh, experience and so forth need to be developed because what you're describing um, are people who have a responsibility for um, involvement with people with disability that are very demanding and very difficult and very challenging. I think that's absolutely right, yeah. Um, but I think that's also um, sitting in a cultural position at the moment or a systemic position at the moment where the kind of training that we're providing to people who work with people with disability is moving increasingly online, it's moving increasingly to short yeah. Uh, um, sort of sessions where um, uh, people try to complete those as quickly as they can. Uh, so light touch training that people are rushing through as quickly as possible, uh, it, that's not transformative education. Um, so we need to think about uh, how we can frame education in ways that uh, it's going to result in um, uh, cultural change uh, as well as skill development uh, for people, uh, and so when and so, and how people can be educated in ways that um, they're they're learning together, so that that people with disability are developing the skills that they need, but at the same time, because the sphere of influence of people with disability is very small, so they can they can develop their skills, but if their skills are not well received, their their strategies are not well received, then they they they're not going to work very well for them. Um, so at the same time as people with disability are being skilled, then the people who work with them need to, to be skilled as well. And not through those those light touch, skimpy resource mm. uh, sorts of um, education. The NDIS has not done well for us in terms of training and development of the workforce. Um, it's an area where um, we're seeing um, lots of cuts around um, workforce training. Um, and I think that's an issue for the Commission to explore. Um, just picking up on uh, a question was put to you by um, Commissioner Sackbell, Commissioner Atkinson, uh, is at least, in terms of achieving a real life, is at least a predicate of that choice in the way that you refer to it in 47, or is that paragraph 47, or is that still too simplistic? Oh, without a doubt, yeah. Um, uh, without I, a doubt is too simplistic or without <laughs> a doubt that's real? No, um, uh, without a doubt, I think people having meaningful choice and the opportunity to express choice, um, but to have choice um, taken up and received and made meaningful um, is a fundamental um, issue. 
and and have choices that really mean something. Yes, yeah. Not just a choice between two bad options. Yes, yeah. And the opportunity to practice choice and develop skill in making choices, to develop confidence that they're not going to be punished for making uh, the wrong choice. Uh, all of those things around skill, uh, around choice and decision making, um, are fundamental. Um, uh, perhaps you may well have already covered this to some extent, but uh, um, did you have anything to say to the Commission about what you'd hoped might come out of the Commission's yes, I do. deliberations? <laughs> uh, thank you, I do. Um, I um, very much hope that the Commission will take particular account of people who are not going to appear uh, in a hearing room and speak the way that I'm speaking with you today. Uh, I think that their experiences are of critical importance to your work. Uh, um, so I, I think that their stories are ethically and practically difficult and fragile to capture. Uh, so I hope that there will be um, either specialist staff or specialist processes that um, you'll use to, uh, to capture um, the stories of people with complex needs um, due to cognitive disability or circumstance. Um, uh, I think uh, I just really want to emphasise how important it is that, that those people um, have a, a place uh, in the, the stories of the Commission. Um, I would like to um, also talk about the... Um, it, it, it sits outside of the group home focus, but it relates to it. Uh, and it's about family violence uh, and the, the, the place of the experience of people with disability um, who experience family violence. Um, I think that that is another difficult and delicate task, but one that's incredibly important for the Commission to explore. I think there's a terrible silence in research and policy about the family violence that people with disability experience, uh, and shedding light here and identifying new ways to improve the safety of people with disability in their homes, particularly children, but also adults. Um, well, is when you talk about family violence, what are you talking about? What's the range that you're I'm talking about? talking about a broad range. Um, I, I think there are the experiences of um, women who, ex who are subjected, and, and men, uh, who are subject to domestic violence. But I'm also talking about children who um, experience, and uh, children who experience violence from their family members, but uh, adults who experience um, violence and abuse from their caregiving family members as well. Mm -hmm. um, so a, the, a broad range of violence in the family home. Um, there's, um, there is some research around um, domestic and family violence um, that, that adults experience, um, a very little bit about children, but I think there is very little about um, the experience of, um, of adults with disability who experience violence from their family caregivers. Um, so I would really urge the Commission to, um, to explore that in, in depth. Uh, I haven't really had a chance to um, explore the part of my statement around compliance mechanisms and the limits of compliance uh, and complaints-driven approaches, um, but uh, I really hope that the Commission is going to um, interrogate the limits of, of complaints um, for people with disability who use services um, and the fact that it is incredibly difficult for people with disability to um, instigate complaints. Um, because of the way that power works in services and because of the, the issues of having cognitive disability um, and the limits of um, compliance systems and the, the difference between audit and evaluation. Uh, uh, and um, I sincerely hope... Sorry, the difference between audit and evaluation? Audit and evaluation? By which you mean... Uh, that the, the audit um, checks whether services have complied with their obligations and evaluation explores quality uh, with, with people um, sure. and there's an opportunity to um, turn up things that you might not expect. So it's different, different from tick a box. Yeah. 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 Okay. The, I think um, there's an, a really r interesting question for you um, that's different from the other Royal Commissions um, about quality standards, because in the disability field, we've had the disability services standards for a long time, which have 
uh, included a standard about abuse and neglect. Um, and so while um, the, the Aged Care and the Child Sexual Abuse Commissions have added um, standards, I, I think there's a really interesting question for you about whether there's any merit in adding further practice standards and a question about why uh, the standards that we've got haven't changed uh, the, the level of abuse that people, or seemingly haven't changed, the level of abuse that people experience. Um, uh, and so what is it about practice standards that is really not leading to any changing practice in, in our field? Um, and then um, I think there's also um, something that I would like to just recognise that the responses to harm in services have really been professionally uh, designed and controlled um, and the importance of um, the grassroots involvement of people with disability, including people with intellectual disability, um, in defining and recognising and um, uh, designing responses to abuse and neglect that work for them. Uh, that, um, and I'm conscious of the irony of me sitting here as an egghead saying that, <laughs> but I think it's very important. Um, and finally, um, I, I guess my last point is that um, we're really good at talking to ourselves about this problem, um, and this is a community problem. Uh, and I think the reach of the Royal Commission is very important in raising the place of the broader community, in understanding what they can do um, to, first of all, care about this as an issue, but secondly, to know what to do to, when they see something, um, when people see something that uh, they feel uncomfortable about. Because I don't think that the wider community is completely um, uncaring about the fact that people experience violence and abuse, but I think people don't know what to do. Um, so I, I think that there is a, an important role for the Commission in um, practically building awareness um, and practically building um, skill in the wider community about what kind of action that, that people can take when they see things that they're concerned about. That last point is fundamental. You can't achieve transformational change unless you can achieve attitudinal change within the broader community that in turn drives political change. Mm. And that's what royal commissions can do. They don't always do it, but they can sometimes. Mm. So you're talking about practical things that people can do. Can you give some examples? Maybe I could just tell a personal story. Yeah. Um, I was um, <laughs> standing at the donut shop. This is going <laughs> to um, tell you about my bad habits. Um, and um, I was rewarding myself for doing my groceries. Um, and there was a, a lady and her son um, standing next to me. And he was um, in his wheelchair. And we're both standing there waiting for our donuts. And he was making his excited donut noise. And mine was just internal, my excited donut noise. His was external. And he was patting the glass and making his noise. And I turned to her and said, oh, what a lovely little boy you've got. You know, like you say with a kid. Yeah. And she said, that's the first time anybody has ever said anything nice about my son to me. And he was eight. And you think, you're like, how hard is it, really, um, to just treat people like people? Um, and, and it... Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Pat, just picking up on what Commissioner Atkinson was asking about, when we know that people without disability feel safe in their own home, or subjectively, that's a subjective feeling, how can we make people with disability feel safe in the same way? You've articulated some of the practical steps, but what fundamentally needs to change if, under the convention, people with disability can achieve the right to feel safe, again, noting it's subjective, on the same basis as a person without a disability would expect to feel safe in their own home? I know that might be a very broad question. Are there some high-level suggestions that you can give in how we can change that? I think some of the things are um, about making some really fundamental commitments to not do things like um, it's not okay to have 30 people go through someone's house in a week. 
um, it's very difficult to feel safe when you don't know who's coming through the door. Um, so some of those practices, uh, the, the benchmarking against what is actually okay in an ordinary life, uh, we're, we're not benchmarking against what's okay um, for, for um, a person in an ordinary house, in an ordinary street, in an ordinary family. Um, our, our benchmarking against what's all right um, is so skew if um, that we're, we, we've really lost sight of what's um, acceptable. Uh, be, because the system has been so crisis driven for so long. Um, and I, th I think that the system is full of good people trying to do good things. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I don't want to demonise um, at all uh, the disability services system. I think that there are heaps of good people doing the, their very best. Um, but the, it's been crisis driven for so long and it's so resource constrained um, that um, people just keep working within the system that they've got. There needs to be some fundamental system reform. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For coming. Thank you for your evidence. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Commissioner said... You, you can now go and have a donut if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should tell you that yesterday, after the end of the hearing... Day, I don't know whether you should actually say this. Uh, but. <laughs> um, a whole bunch yep. of donuts mm. were brought <laughs> back from the staff. So I think it's this is a common... Uh, Common reward for well, I, I, I must work. explain the reason for that, <coughs> Commissioner, and that is that um, at the convention centre during the course of the day, the wafts of the donuts yes. made their way up to the commission hearing room, and uh, I think all of us followed the scent. No, so resistant. that may explain why the the donuts came. All right, may I turn to important matters? Unfortunately, no we're not doing a royal commission into the causes of obesity in the general population. <laughs> not yet. yet. Uh, I'm just noting the time, and we are to adjourn just before 1 p.m. The public advocate, Colleen Pearce, is here, and uh, I was hoping to start her evidence before lunch, so if we could just perhaps commence, sure. and we may complete 15 to 20 minutes, yeah. uh, well, and we then we'll continue. Well, we should adjourn no later than 12.55 to give people a chance to look at whatever is happening at one o'clock uh, with the award. So by all means, let's start, and we'll adjourn mm. at uh, 12.55 or a little before. So we may just need a, a minute or so just to reconstitute the bar table and for Colleen Pierce to all come right, so to the sh room. Shall we just take a very short adjournment and come convenient. back? That's convenient. Thank you. Bye.
Yes. Uh, Commissioner, there's one additional appearance. If the Commission pleases, my name is Philip Grano and I appear on behalf of the Public Advocate. Thank you very much, Mr. Black. Thank you. The Commissioners uh, will have the Public Advocate's statement and some <coughs> documents behind tab 16 and the additional documents up to tab 21. And the Commissioners may also have a further statement of Dr. Pearce uh, with uh, an additional report and that was a statement made on 22 December and I'm not sure whether that has got a tab number yet. Tab 68. Tab 68. Maybe November. 16A. 16A. 16A? Yes. Oh. 12th December. I'm not sure I have a 16A but that may be because I don't know where to look. That's right. We can... Dr. Pierce's evidence will cover this immediate period before lunch and then after lunch, so we can make sure 16A is available to you over the lunch adjournment. Right. Dr. Pierce, this is just the usual confusion that attaches to hearings, but uh, if you wouldn't mind taking the oath or affirmation as you wish. Yes. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Um, Ms. Eastman will ask you some questions. Thank you. So you are Dr. Colleen Pierce. Yes. And you are the public advocate in Victoria. Yes. And you've prepared the statements for the Royal Commission. And uh, can we take the statements as true and correct? You can. Thank you. Can I start with uh, just helping us understand a little bit about the role of the public advocate? You were appointed to the role initially on the 7th of September 2007, and then you have been reappointed in that role from September 2014, and your term ends on 6 September 2021. That's correct. And the appointment is made under Victorian legislation, the Guardianship and Administration Act of 1986. Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about what the role involves and what your particular responsibilities are? Mm -hmm. Well, the primary function under the Guardianship and Administration Act is to act as guardian of last resort for uh, Victorians <coughs> with a disability um, in Victoria who are in need of assistance in making decisions. And in terms of how you came to this role, uh, can you tell the commissioners a little bit about your background, qualifications and experience that brought you to the role of public advocate? Um, yes, I've worked in um, social care and health settings for um, all of my life. I've um, perhaps some of the more recent appointments were the CEO of the North Richmond Community Health Centre. That may be familiar to some of you as the place with the safe injecting room in Victoria that's causing some controversy. Um, I've also run a very large uh, drug treatment centre, one of the largest in the state. Um, I've worked for the Uniting Church as Director of um, their community services across Victoria and um, Tasmania and in the Department of Justice as the um, Director of the um, Victims of Crime Unit um, in the Department of Justice. I have, um, uh, my qualifications are a um, arts degree, uh, a Diploma of Education, a Graduate Diploma in Health Services Man Management, a Master's in Health Services Management, and an Honorary Doctorate from um, RMIT. So I might to start now by taking you to the statement, so if the Commissioners wish to, to follow. At paragraph 9, you set out the powers and duties and functions. Yes. And looking at the, the list there, it's a very extensive list of both functions and powers. They include such matters as to act as a guardian, where appointed by the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Your role includes seeking assistance in the best interests of any person with disability from any government, department, institution, welfare, organisation or service provider. Your functions include making representations, but also investigating complaints 
and investigating matters that may be referred to you by the tribunal. Your role also seems to have a function of promotion, education and developing an understanding around the rights and needs of people with disability in Victoria. So it seems to be uh, an enormous role that you have. Um, it is a, a very big role, but I do have um, around 100 staff working in, in the office with me, so um, I'm able to fulfil <laughs> those um, functions with the resources that I have. So in terms of the way in which the office operates, uh, have you uh, divided these functions in a way? Because some of your functions also involve the care and concern of older people, is that right? Yes. Well, um, when I'm appointed as guardian of last resort, um, there is a um, advocate guardian team that is responsible um, for, who has delegated the responsibility for making those decisions. And the decisions will depend on the powers given to me by VCAT. It could be an accommodation decision, access to services, um, access uh, to persons are probably the more common ones, but there are others um, that we, I might be given from time to time. The investigations team um, last year undertook around 400 investigations on behalf of VCAT. I should point out that the investigations are driven by requests from VCAT. It's not an independent mm -hmm. complaints function and I don't have um, independent um, own motion investigative powers, notwithstanding I have asked for them on many occasions. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, just in the time available, <laughs> I wanted to start a little bit by understanding about the scope and function of your responsibilities as a guardian of last resort mm -hmm. for people whose accommodation may involve group homes. Mm -hmm. So reading your statement, I think you're currently the guardian for 938 people in Victoria. Mm -hmm. And in relation to that cohort, you make decisions about the accommodation for 812 of those people. Mm -hmm. Of that group, how many within that 812 are people with disability in the context of decisions around group homes as an accommodation option? The majority of the accommodation decisions relate to people over the age of 65 mm -hmm. and whether or not they can remain in their own home. We. Um, do have a growing number of people uh, with disability for whom we are making um, accommodation decisions. For many years we were very pleased to see that the number of people with um, intellectual disabilities or other cognitive impairments was a declining number, but with the um, impact of NDIS and the complexities there, we are certainly seeing a rise in the number um, of people for whom um, I make decisions in relation to accommodation who would have an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. Many of those would be very complex people, um, some of whom may be um, in hospital settings or in prisons, and the question is whether or not a group home, which is one of the alternatives, would be suitable for them. Right. And in, in your statement, you refer to a document described as a guide about decision making for accommodation. Mm -hmm. I don't know, have you got the copy of the Yes. Connections with you. It's described yes. as attachment five, mm -hmm. and I'll just check has that got a separate tab number? Yep. <coughs> Behind tab 21. Mm -hmm. And can you just tell us a little bit about the development of this document and the uh, methodology in terms of the approach to decision making? Because when we come back after lunch, I want to talk to you about the human rights framework <coughs> and your evidence touching on a human rights framework. Mm -hmm. But just perhaps before the lunch adjournment, can we deal with this one document? So the Commission has got, should be described as accommodation decisions. But just to give us an introduction to the approach yes. or the methodology around decision making yes. of this kind. Yes. Well, um, the office has a range of practice guidelines. I think there's around um, 20 odd practice guidelines to give people, um, to give advocate guardians guidance on how they might make decisions. Mm -hmm. So the practice guideline, which is number one, which um, relates to accommodation decisions, that's because accommodation is by far the um, uh, most numerous decisions that um, we have to make. So the guideline covers 
um, a range of um, matters, um, mostly around um, the uh, relevance of the Guardianship and Administration Act, the relevance of the Human Rights Charter, and then goes on to prov provide a range of guidance material for um, guardians in making decisions in relation to accommodation. And, and this is a document that's publicly available? Uh, generally, they were on our, all our guidelines were on our website. Um, some of them, this one uh, is due for review this month. Um, so some of them aren't, um, may not be on our website, but they're certainly available on request. And at paragraph 102 of your statement, if you can turn to that, it's page 25. You describe there that you've asked your staff uh, for some practice wisdom that informs their decision making, especially in relation to group homes. And uh, you say you are advised that guardians also consider a range of issues. So can I just ask you to touch on the matters that are set out in paragraph 102, sure. at paragraph A to H. So these are things such as the age of the represented person, the age of others in the home, behaviours, geographical location and the like. Mm. So in making a decision, we um, carefully consider, we start with the um, individual and their unique set of circumstances. Um, as guardian of last resort, I'm uh, required to um, make the least restrictive decision um, and uh, wherever possible give effect to a person's um, wishes. Um, but also uh, predominantly to act in their best interests. So in looking at the unique circumstances of each individual, we would need to consider a range of factors where they live. Do they want to be close to their family? Do they have family that's nearby? So geographic location and um, what their age is. So um, are we looking at a um, aged care facility or whether they can live at home with supports? Um, uh, their local ties in the community, can they live in their neighbourhood or do they need to move somewhere else to get access to the supports and services that they need? Do they have a forensic background and that requires that they live perhaps in a, a particular set of mm -hmm. um, arrangements? So there's a range of matters that we consider, but because accommodation is such a difficulty for uh, my office in finding suitable accommodation, often um, there's very limited choices in where we can place a person. And that's that's what I wanted to ask you. These Ms. are... Ms Eastman, I'm sorry. Yes. Could we perhaps uh, finish here because it's just before five to so one? I've got one question to finish on this topic um, and then we'll adjourn. So just completing on this topic. Very good. Having regard to the range of factors that are taken into account, is it the case that there's always choice available that can accommodate all those factors? Or is it often the case that notwithstanding all of these factors, there might only be one accommodation option available? Or, or in many cases, none. Um, so there are very limited choices and options, particularly for people with complex presentations. Yes, thank you. Uh, that completes just that issue. When we come back, we will uh, return to a human rights framework and then start to investigate well, some of the other elements. Well, we'll, the Commission, please. We'll adjourn until about 2.35 to make sure that uh, people have an opportunity to view the awards. Thank you. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms Eastman. Thank you, Commissioners. So we're returning to Dr Pierce's evidence. And Dr Pierce, I want to start with some changes that are going to take place in March next year. So as at the 1st of March, the amendments to the Guardianship and Administration Act will commence, and that will increase your functions in addition to the functions that we talked about this morning. And the additional functions include a function to promote the human rights of persons with disability, to protect persons with disability from abuse, neglect and exploitation, 
to undertake advocacy for people with disability on a systemic basis and to manage and coordinate programs that will promote the human rights of persons with disability. So these will be part of the new powers and duties, is that right? Yes. And reading your statement and the reports, the annual reports, it's clear from your 2017-2018 annual report that you advocate strongly for what you describe as a human rights approach. And I want to ask you a little bit about that. Mm. In your statement, you say that what was utmost in your mind was respect for the dignity of people with disability. And that was uh, the, a reason for why you wanted to really promote a human rights-based approach. Is that right? Uh, yes, um, but I think it's a little bit more than that as well. Um, the mission of the office is to uphold and promote the rights of people with disability and people with a mental illness. So it's imbued in everything that the office does. And we are also bound by the Victorian Human Rights Charter as well. So I wanted to, to ask you about that because a human rights approach in Victoria is not new. Mm -hmm. And I assume that your office is a public authority. Yes. To the extent that is a, a specific definition in the Charter of Rights applying to government agencies, government departments and those performing public functions. So you've had a human rights function for a period of time, is that right? Yes. And in terms of the Charter though, the Charter of Rights and Responsibilities in Victoria is a fairly generic human rights mm -hmm. statement. you agree with that? Yes, I do. And so it reflects the, the international human rights that may be found in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Mm -hmm. It's not a disability specific focus. That's right. And in terms of how the Charter deals with disability at the present time, is it right to understand that it's essentially how those more generic human rights, say Section 8, the right to equality, or rights concerning privacy and the like, might also touch upon the interests of people with disability rather than being specific for people with disability? Yes. And it, what has your experience of working with the Charter been in terms of a human rights approach? Mm. Well, I think it's been um, very important, very significant, and it is part of um, that alongside the um, UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities have um, helped move the paradigm shift the paradigm, shift the discussion really from um, a situation where people were people with disabilities were managed um, and were to be protected to one where we see people as holders of rights. Now, the Guardianship and Administration uh, Act, and particularly where I'm appointed as guardian of last resort, um, that is a limitation on a person's rights. Mm. So what the Charter does is... Um, ensures that in making decisions that limit a person's rights that they are reasonable, justified and proportionate. So it has a very significant impact on the way we make our decisions and for our accountability. So for example, if we, um, if someone requests a statement of reasons for decisions, then we will outline that in terms of the charter rights. So the way that the charter operates on uh your office as a public authority is that in effect you have to act consistently in your decision making and in the work that you do in a manner that reflects those charter rights. That's right. And uh, has this uh, been enhanced by taking the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? How has that convention added to the responsibilities that you already have under the Charter? Look, I'll probably start with the um, Guardianship and Administration Act of 1986. That's the current Guardianship and Administration Act. And I said earlier that um, we make decisions that, that um, give effect to a person's wishes wherever possible, are least restrictive, um, but are in a person's best interests. Mm. And I often say to uh, people, if I was making a decision for you, would you like me to make it according to what I thought was in your best interests or according to your will and preference? Mm. 
and I think um, most people say that they would like it made in accordance with their will and preference mm. rather than in um, what may be considered a more paternalistic approach of um, best interests. Mm. So um, we still have that legislation, but um, with the advent of the Human Rights Charter and just immediately preceding that, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, we were, um, we now have to take that into account in the work that we do. And as I said, that's reflected in um, not just the way we make decisions, but in all of the work that we do mm. in the office um, is really very much a rights, I, I describe my office as a rights focused um, office, mm. and we have to consider that in everything that we do. Mm. Is there any, sorry, can I interrupt? Is there anything in Victorian legislation that requires you to take into account the terms of the UN Convention? The um, new Guardianship and Administration Act, which comes into effect on the 1st of March next year, is designed to be consistent with the UN Convention on the Rights of People with a Disability. So that will be the first guardianship legislation in Australia that is really compliant with um, the UN Convention. But and up, that's to, up to now, there's been nothing in Victorian domestic law that implements the Convention as such. Well, I think the uh, the Disability Act does try to give effect to the Charter as far as possible. Um, and you just look at the principles contained within the Disability Act and they um, are, were designed with the um, Charter, with the Convention in mind. So you can see that in the Disability Act, but there are few, um, well, actually, I think the new Mental Health Act as well um, mm. would take into account some of the um, Convention on the Rights of People with Disability as well. What, what I wanted to ask you then, I think you've just touched on this in terms of the place of Victoria. Given Victoria's experience with the Charter and comparing uh, the way in which guardianship models operate in the states and territory that doesn't have a Charter of Rights, do you see any particular difference, and you may not know from a comparative perspective, but just do you see any difference in a jurisdiction that has a rights-based focus compared to those jurisdictions that don't have a Charter of Rights? Um, I th it, it's hard for me to answer that, but I can say what it does is really sharpen our focus on rights, and that is a little bit different to um, my colleagues in other jurisdictions, but their legislation is also mm. slightly different. Mm. So it is hard to say, but we are very much a rights-focused organisation. So often when we talk about human rights, we can talk about the nature of a right in a fairly abstract concept. And the challenge can often be translating rights in a convention or on a piece of paper into practical reality for people. Yep. Can, you, can you help us with some examples about where this focus on a rights-based approach has had a practical implementation or uh, in implementation actually made a change or a difference mm -hmm. for, for a person with disability? Well, um, if you'll indulge me, I think one of the, one of the um, matters that I, I always think about is um, Eleanor Roosevelt and um, her quote on human rights. And she talked about where do we find universal human rights in small places close to home. Mm -hmm. So um, when I'm thinking about the work of the office, we often work in very small places, mm. close to people's homes, making very fundamental um, decisions about an individual's life. And that in um, making those decisions, we have to think about them as both an individual and their inherent worth as an individual, the dignity that goes um, that sits alongside of that. And so our decisions sometimes do seem to be very small. Um, but um, giving effect to um, some of those um, rights, which is, I think, where you said, where can I think it makes a difference? Mm. I think it makes a difference in the way we approach our work um, and how we make our decisions, how we involve people with disability in the work of the office. And I think it's in those very small, intangible ways um, that we see the differences mm. in the office and the work that we do. Well, when we take an instrument like the Victorian Charter of Rights and Responsibilities, that whole model is described in the sort of human rights parlance as a dialogue model, mm -hmm. where each arm of government has a particular responsibility. 
And the theory behind the dialogue model is that it helps change culture within government in terms of developing a human rights culture. And is this something that you've seen operate in Victoria in the areas that you're responsible for? Has At that dialogue model changed the culture? Yes, and um, every year the Victorian um, Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission does a report on the Charter, and we would be one of the organisations that would contribute to that. And we can see the evolution um, over an, a, a number of years of how the Charter has had an impact um, on organisations. And um, we see that in um, the conversations that they have with people, how they involve people with disabilities um, or um, other sections of the community in the work that they do, how they're engaged, um, how it's reflected in their policies and procedures, how it's reflected in their processes, um, and how it's reflected in more broadly in the work that we do. So the Charter has, in my view, made a very significant impact um, on the culture, the human rights culture and landscape in Victoria. So given that the focus of the culture, of, of the charter and culture has been within government, taking it to the next step, have you seen any of that cultural change occur for <coughs> private sector bodies or the private providers, which might not be public authorities for the purpose of the charter? but very much the work they do is engaged, is engaging with Victorian legislation. Is that something you're able to comment on? It's just taking uh, yes. those charter rights and the culture into a private sector setting. Look, I think that um, most um, of the organisations you're talking about would be certainly cognisant of um, the UNCRPD, and that would be reflected, at least in theory, um, in the work that they do. The Charter is less relevant to them. They're not bound by mm. the Charter in the same way. But has it um, drifted down into the actual culture of the organisation? I don't know that it has, because one of um, the issues about um, human rights is the ability to live a life that is um, that respects the human dignity of every individual, but the right of people to live free from violence, abuse and neglect. And when we see um, such um, numerous um, examples around violence, abuse and neglect in this state that does have a charter, you have to say um, those organisations have some responsibility um, in that. And I don't think we see it as reflected um, as well as it might be um, in those organisations. So I think that's one of the gaps. So the changes that you've seen in the public sector and organisations subject to the charter haven't necessarily been reflected the extent to which those obligations no, might I don't also believe so. stretch to the private sector. All right, I want to change course a little bit. Mm -hmm. One of the issues, as you know, for this hearing is group homes. And mm -hmm. I think you're aware that some of the evidence that the Commission will hear in the course of this week will be that the group home model can be replaced and that there must be better alternatives. And so I just want to explore with you your views on where the group home model fits. And this morning, the Royal Commission has heard evidence about the, the move to deinstitutionalisation from the large institution into a group home model. And we've also heard some evidence today about the use of restraints and whether the uh, use of restraints creates the environment of violence and is this a symptom of a group home or a cause? So I'm just interested to explore with you, did you have a view about the utility of a group home model for mm. Victoria? Mm. Look, I, I think that's the wrong place to start. The place, mm. the place to start is um, should people with disability, the same as everyone else in the community, have a right to choose where they live and who they live with? And that is the starting point. And um, we all live in very different circumstances. Some of us live on our own. Some of us live with our families. Some of us live with our friends. So the question is, do people have the right um, to have a choice about where they live? And if they have a choice to live um, 
uh, where they live, how can we ensure that that environment that they live in is one that protects their human rights and creates opportunities for human flourishing? And so in my view, it's not the group home model per se, but it's, it's what created that environment. So um, uh, as guardian of last resort, I, I'm in and out of, oh, not me, but my delegates are in and out of a whole range of residential settings. And I can tell you um, the abuse of um, people with disabilities is widespread and it's not confined to group homes. So unless you tackle the very fundamental issues mm. that go to the heart of um, why um, people um, with disabilities are subject to such high levels of abuse, then any model will just turn out to be the same as the next. Mm. So are there particular uh, features then of group homes that you think need to be addressed mm -hmm. if the group home model was to be consistent with that right to live independently or the right in relation to choice or the right in terms of living a life with dignity? Mm. How, I think there's a well, few I things you wanted to focus on, on on how we might approach that group home model from that perspective? Yeah. Um, so um, I think if we start with um, the one size fits all, yes. and that's where we start. Um, one size fits all is the wrong paradigm. Uh, and I often, if I'm in a group of people, I'll number you off, one, two, three, four, five. Now the five of you are going to live together you're going to share the one bathroom, you're going to have meals at the same time, you're going to go to bed at the same time, you're going to eat the same kinds of food. Well, I mean, how is that reflective of human dignity and, and choice? So um, it's the one size fits all model that is one of the contributing factors um, to um, uh, violence and abuse in group homes. I mean, wouldn't you be frustrated? I, I would really struggle with that. Um, not to have choice about um, what kinds of food I ate, who I lived with, when I could use the bathroom, when I could go to bed. So, well, do that, we... those sort of issues of choices arise because of the culture of a group home, governance issues, workforce issues. What sort well, of comes around, into it's, play? It's all of mm. it's all of the above, um, and we have uh, a workforce that is um, poorly paid, um, who tries. I think the majority of um, disability workers try very hard to do a good job. They have limited resources. Um, we have a highly casualised um, workforce with little training. Um, so uh, that's part of the problem. So we have a whole range of workplace issues. Why do we have a casualised workforce? Well, I think it's the same as in aged care. We've got some of the lowest paid um, people um, and in some particular homes, I mean, we know that where we have a stable workforce, fully employed, where they know the residents, where we have a relationship, we are likely to see um, less abuse. But in situations where we have a casualised workforce, this is often in homes where there may be high levels of violence, um, then um, the workforce is very hard to retain staff. It's very hard in that environment. So um, they're the houses where the, you have high turnover and you do not have um, a familiarity with the staff and their particular needs. Mm. You also have with the workforce the um, balancing the tension between um, is it a home or is it a workplace? Mm. So what are the issues that arise there? The Royal Commission's heard evidence, for example, that uh, the house might be organised around the people coming into the house to provide services mm. rather than the other way around. Is that um, the, and that, the issue? That, that is the challenge. That is the tension that I think disability service providers have to um, find the balance. When they find the balance, we find a good group home. But that same uh, tension between is it a home or is it a workplace will be inherent in other models where people require support. One of the witnesses uh, told the Royal Commission yesterday that his, his concern was the lack of individualised care, the standardisation of care and routine took away 
his dignity and I think he said just moving into that environment that he felt that he lost control mm. of his life. Is that, that a sentiment that you've seen? Indeed. Um, we certainly say there should be genuine person-centred planning. We, ha we have to start with the individual but um, community visitors will tell me that they also go into houses and they, they look at plans and they could be NDIS plans, and you see the same thing replicated for each of the residents. Well, how, how is that individualised mm. planning if they all have the same plan mm. when, we're, we're, when we're all different? But the other thing I wanted to say about group homes, um, and it will apply for others, um, is that um, they are closed environments. So the only people that often enter into those environments, occasionally you might have family members or friends, um, that's less likely. Um, it's more likely that you're only going to have um, paid employees in that environment. So what are the consequences of that well, type of arrangement? Well, I think it's the closed environment that, um, that is a breeding ground for human rights abuses. And um, we see... Um, uh, the um, OPCAT, the Optional Protocol mm. on the Convention Against Torture, requires um, active monitoring. Mm. Um, and uh, that is one of the roles that community visitors do, the mm. active monitoring of a closed environment. Mm. Now, in terms of restrictive practices, although people aren't necessarily civilly detained in those environments, mm. try and leave, try and go out on your own, try and, you know, go somewhere without the group in a bus. Mm. Um, so it's this removal of your capacity to actually leave unsupervised that makes them places that could be considered in some circumstances as places of detention. Well, and could, I, could I go back to the point you made about uh, the NDIS plans, apparently individualised, but all exactly the same? Yes. Um, who does those plans? Our planners. And who are the planners? Um, they're NDIS um, planners. I believe they're contract workers. Some of them may be employees. Employees of the place where the person is living? No. Right. No. Okay. No, it's the ND NDIS plans. Mm. And so would they not see a problem in developing exactly the same plan for each individual in a group home? Apparently not. But I think I think in part that was um, I often say what's um, what is a, an issue for transition and what is an issue for um, full scheme and um, during tran transition we needed a large number of people to be put on plans very quickly so there was a lot of pressure uh, at at the time of plan review, I, I am hoping that we do see more individualised plans, but certainly in the transition, it was not uncommon for community visitors to report to me that they did see plans that were exactly the same. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. Uh, I think that the next area was governance or systems and processes. Did you want to speak uh, about that topic in the context of the group home model? Um, just given my role, I'm also um, engaged with um, aged care and I'm aware of the Aged Care Royal Commission and um, indeed the events that led to that with Oakton. But one of the changes to the aged care standards um, is the introduction of a new standard on organisational mm. governance. Mm. Um, and that is that um, the board or the governing body of um, an organisation is absolutely now to be held accountable for a range of issues that occur within their facilities. And so whether that's um, uh, the monitoring of complaints, um, medication <coughs> errors, restrictive practices, it's absolutely clear that the board is responsible for that. And I think one of the missing pieces here is what do boards of disability organisations actually know about what is going on mm. um, in their organisations? To me, that's where the buck stops. Um, these are large, um, multi-million dollar organisations. Some of them are private, for-profit corporations. And what is the requirement for the boards to absolutely be held to account for what occurs um, in their facilities, and are they even aware of what 
of what goes on. Well, had just dealing with boards and the human rights standards and culture that you've talk, talked about, mm. how do we instill a human rights culture into a board and a governance process of, of the providers in this sector? Well, I, I think holding the boards responsible, I can tell you that um, uh, aged care providers have absolutely been riveted by Standard 8, which says mm -hmm. that the board yeah. is responsible and um, um, quality assurance um, or clinical governance committees mm. are springing up in every aged care mm. facility as a consequence of that. And um, and they're, they're being um, monitored and to, held to account for it. Mm. Um, but when... Um, when community visitors tell me that they report multiple issues to agencies who uh, don't even have the courtesy of responding to community visitor reports, um, or we have issues that go on for years and years and years, um, how is it that the board is not aware of um, these these matters? Now, some of these are what I talk about, the small issues close to home, mm -hmm. but all of those are the environments in which we live that contribute to um, the abuse and neglect of the residents. Um, and the other principle, I think, in terms of gov governance is how are people with disability um, engaged with their service? Um, so... so what, do you, uh, what do you mean by... Well, by that um, engagement they, in a government or... No, a are, they, are they engaged with the sense? service in terms of um, advisory committees? Uh, do they have a seat at um, uh, the board of, on a board of governance? Do they um, uh, contribute to co-design um, of services? Um, the Victorian Mental Health Royal Commission in its report, the first thing it started with was the per person with the mental mental illness, so the consumer. Mm -hmm. So I say it has to be the person with the disability that really leads mm -hmm. some of these changes um, and has to be at front and centre, at the forefront of that. Have you seen any practice to that effect in Victoria? Oh, look, we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see <coughs> some of it. Um, I think it would be fair to say that um, Urala has had some very significant issues that it's had to deal with, and as a consequence, um, they have really looked at how they might um, turn around um, their organisation. So they've got a, a number of committees. Um, I'm sure other organisations do as well um, that, that spring to mind. But it, it's more than just being on an advisory committee. It's being um, part of the actual organisation, the governance of the organisation, involved in co-design, involved in evaluation. Um, and so what it requires is an empowerment model mm -hmm of people with a disability. So culture's set from the top down, so the board has to be responsible um, for setting that culture in its policies, procedures, in its vision, in its statement, but it won't ever work unless you have an empowered group of residents who are able, uh, feel comfortable and safe to talk about what is happening to them. Mm -hmm. Um, and when they live in an environment where they can speak up, where they're encouraged to speak up, where they're encouraged to be part of making the house rules, um, to being an individual in the place where they live, we won't see changes until we see that um, top-down, um, bottom-up, if I could put mm. it that way. So does that touch into the area of systems and processes, is developing effective pathways for people to make inquiries make complaints, know that complaints might be acted on within their own environment, not just to external agencies? Yeah. So one, one, one is, um, you know, the culture of complaint. And mm. um, actually the Victorian Disability Services Commissioner had a um, campaign of it's OK to complain. Mm. So we have to change the, our thinking to say, yes, it's OK to complain. Um, because a complaint is actually just another form of feedback. Um, is the word even complaint perhaps a little impediment that the concept of complaint carries with it? It Some does. Some overlay. Is there better language in this area well, that I'm we could use? I'm not sure if there's better language, but, for example, community visitors, when they make a referral to the Disability Services Commissioner, we, we sometimes have to think of it in terms of complaint, when it's not actually a complaint. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's very hard to think about what a person wants to frame that in terms of a complaint. So we need um, the complaints model um, is extremely useful and extremely helpful, but doesn't cover all circumstances. 
Uh, another issue that you wanted to speak about was the area of inappropriate placements as a, a cause possibly of violence, abuse, neglect, exploitation mm. in group homes and the group home model. Mm. Is that essentially that question of choice about who you live with or is that question really around who determines where someone lives and the circumstances it, in which it, they'll move? It's all of those things. Mm. I mean, if you, you don't have a choice where you live, that means or who you live with. Um, and I ask um, people here to imagine what it would be like if I told you that um, I was moving in with you. Uh, you don't know me, you don't know anything about me, um, and you don't have any choice about who your co-residents are. Sometimes you're not even given a choice when they move out. So there's no involvement, there's no engagement of people who are living in these houses around who their co-residents might be. And there's often a lack of choice um, for alternative accommodation. And accommodation is so um, limited that um, you, d you often don't have a choice. And what that means is that in a circumstance where um, you may have a person who is a perpetrator of violence living in a house and a person who's a victim, if I could simplify it like that, you have a victim and a perpetrator living together in a house and under what other circumstances would anyone here in this room think that that was appropriate? You wouldn't. Um, and so why is it that we leave people in very vulnerable circumstances um, without choice and without options? Well, what are the practical steps one that we could take to um, allow the realisation of choice in the way in which you're contemplating? What has to happen? Well, I think we have to start with um, the individual and think about um, person-centred planning so we understand really what those, that person needs and wants, what, they'd, what their wishes are, who they'd like to live with. You start with that, so a genuine person-centred approach. Um, we have to look at how we manage vacancies in houses, how, um, if it is your home, why can't you have a choice over who you live with or where you might move to? Um, but that requires um, greater accommodation options to be available, and at the moment there just simply aren't those um, accommodation options. And where we are starting to see them emerge, um, my concern is that we're seeing a, a reduction in the safeguards in the new models um, that we have, and um, that's rather complicated, but um, the um, with the introduction of the um, NDI S and um, uh, SDA. Um, we now in Victoria have different kinds of leases. So an SDA residential agreement means that um, a person has the same rights that were in the Disability Act. Otherwise, you have a, a just an ordinary lease that doesn't have the same rights protections within it. Um, so there's issues about how is it going to be determined what kind of lease that you get. Generally, I think most providers will opt for an SDA residential lease, but we are certainly seeing what we call SIL houses, where um, there are no um, SDA agreements, so you get less rights there. And community in the brave new world, community visitors visit um, SDA houses. So the new models uh, that are coming online, um, you won't have community visitors visiting if they're not designated as SDA. And that means, in my view, there will be a reduction um, in the rights protection uh, for some people. The Victorian Charter won't apply. No. Will it to uh, any no. of those arrangements because no. they're under the Commonwealth's uh, legislation and administrative yes. arrangements? Yes. Mm. Um, so that's that's entirely, um, in my view, it's entirely problematic because, as I've said earlier, it doesn't matter what model um, of housing you have, if you don't solve the fundamental issues, then you will have this rights abuse. But what people in closed environments do have currently is visits from community visitors. They will not be available and they will not have the SDA rights, tenancy rights. Could you clarify what you mean by still houses? You mentioned just earlier in response 
Still, if I held, how would you? What do you mean by that? Um, what, how, what, still, that? Uh, still houses. Well, they're just a model that's emerging, and they're houses that um, do not get any SDA funding. So, in my office, we've described those as still houses. So they're new models. So they will have um, NDIS participants in them, but it's not. Um, they're not eligible for SDA funding. Could so you perhaps also just I'm trying to understand. Well, I um, mean there might be a group of people so living I, in the house and they're all getting still supported yes. independent living. Yes. And how would that how did that work? Well, perhaps if I give you an example, we're starting to see um, in Victoria we have supported residential services. If you think of a. <laughs> Um, a, a group housing where people live and they, they get some support to, to live in that um, accommodation. Um, some of them um, may be aged, some may have disabilities, the majority will have some form of mental health um, pro uh, issue. We're starting to see some of these providers now just lease houses in the community um, attached to the SRS and um, they are um, perhaps moving people from the SRS, there'll be people with disabilities, there may be people who um, are in receipt of an N N NDIS and get some, uh, some support. So they're moving them into houses in the community that community visitors can't visit. They're probably, it's hard for us to understand because they have no jurisdiction, what the lease arrangements are for those individuals that are moving into this accommodation, but certainly community visitors can't visit. So in these new models, we're starting to really worry about what are the rights protections that are available in those new models. They're essentially privatised arrangements, aren't they? Yes. That, that, so that the lease entered into will reflect uh, a private sector arrangement between a private sector landlord and the tenant. Yes. Uh. And that, that may or may not um, be a good arrangement for those individuals. I don't know because we don't have a window into that, but we do know, as I keep saying, that um, where people live in environments where the only other visitors um, are paid workers, it is an opportunity for abuse um, to occur um, unchecked because there is no human rights monitoring. I might ask you then a little bit about community visitors in Victoria. So a community visitor is somebody who is appointed to that particular role, but they perform it in a volunteer capacity, is yes. that right? And if they're a community visitor, there's certain uh, functions that they have to discharge, and they gen just dealing with the group homes, that generally involves undertaking inspections of the group homes and preparing a report. Yes. That's a simplified version. Yes, that's correct. And the community visitors can visit uh, a home with or without notice, is that right? Um, generally, um, all of our visits are unannounced. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a schedule of visits, um, but we can also visit in response to our request. So our, our um, advice line, we would get a large number of calls every year from uh, people in some form of um, a mental health facility, disability facility, um, and SRS are requesting a visit from community visitors because they have an issue that um, they would like resolved. It, it, we also have um, staff um, who ring anonymously. Um, I liken them to whistleblowers who might say something like, I told my manager about this, but they haven't done anything about it. Um, sometimes it's really a vexatious call, um, but um, more often than not, it's a staff member who's genuinely concerned about um, what's happening in their house. And, and would it be fair to say the community visitor is a little bit like the eyes and ears on the ground? That's certainly um, how we describe them. They are a, um, an ordinary person who enters um, into an, a closed environment and applies the standard of an ordinary person um, to the places that um, they visit. And um, different states have different models of um, community visitors. In Victoria, we have a, a volunteer model and I'm pretty passionate about our volunteer model. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is at any one time we have around 800 volunteers. Um, we provide them with a range of training 
And um, regardless of how long they stay with us, I see it as an investment in the social capital mm. of the community that people, um, often they visit in their local area, um, will know somebody with a disability or understand what it means to live with a disability or understand what it means to live in a closed environment. Mm -hmm. And, and the community visitors, they've got certain powers, if I can describe it that way. They can enter and look at parts of premises. They can speak with the residents. They can ask questions of the employees and the people working in a group home. But they can also look at records that are maintained in the group home. Um, if they're available, uh, mm. I think in, um, if you go back practically every community visitor annual report will talk about um, the lack of access to incident reports. So unless they see an incident report or somebody tells them about an incident, they may not be aware of what's happened in a group home. And I'd have to describe disability services pro service providers as recalcitrant. Uh, and for a v great variety of reasons, community visitors are unable to see the primary documentation um, around what happens in a group home. What? The Disability Services Commissioner and the Department of Human Services sees um, Category 1 or reportable incidents, mm -hmm. and now the, um, the um, Safeguarding Commissioner will see those. But community visitors who visit, who are there to inquire uh, and to observe and monitor, do not have access to those um, documents. And can community visitors also examine whether or not there's the use of any restraints in a home? We heard some evidence this morning about different types of restraints. Is that part of what the community visitors do? Yes, they will They will look at um, restraints. They'll just see in their behavioural support, well, well, whether there's a behavioural support plan, whether the restraints um, are documented um, and whether or not there's been um, involvement of, um, as is required, the senior practitioner in Victoria. But what community visitors do report is other forms of restraint locked doors, locked fridges, the inability of people to leave um, unsupervised, so more environmental restraints. Um, I think for, in most cases, there will be some form of authorisation um, for um, restraint. Do, do the community visitors have any obligation to consult with the families or guardians of residents as part of their monitoring role? No. And um, remember, we're a volunteer organisation. I tell you, we live on a shoestring and the fact that community visitors do the fabulous job that they do with the very limited resources they have is always amazing uh, to me. But um, it's not possible for volunteers then to um, find out who the person's relation is and to ring them. And I mean, there's all kinds of privacy issues involved in that, let alone there just is absolutely no capacity for us to do that. Are you uh, passionate about the Community Visitor Scheme because it's the best model for monitoring or because uh, there are no resources for paid community volunteers to be engaged? Uh, no, I'm passionate about it because it is about social inclusion. In other states, a volunteer model may not work. Um, Victoria does have a very long history um, of um, volunteer organisations <coughs> and social capital, but I, I think in um, states where you have vast geographic areas to cover, it may not be possible, but it works very well here. Um, but there are always tensions um, between um, our ability to do the work, we, 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 how we support our community visitors. And we do have a small paid workforce, um, but it is very small. And um, it might surprise you to learn that community visitors operate on um, books that have carbon copies. Um, and when was the last time you saw a carbon copy? And then they post it into us. We, we don't have the funding for um, electronic reporting. So that, that is an issue. Um, but nonetheless, the community visitors are really good folk who It's enough to warm the heart of a Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I think one of, one of the questions that has arisen is whether the reports made by the community visitors are made immediately available to the residents themselves or their families. And if not, why not? And no, why not? they're made available to the house supervisor mm -hmm. because the report is to the house supervisor. Um, so they're not made generally made available to the family and their visitors, um, sorry, family and um, their friends, partly because community visitors wouldn't know 
necessarily who um, the family members are of the individuals um, in those places. Who are the community visitors? Are they mostly retired people? Some. Uh, in fact, yes, that's true. Some are parents who have a mm. um, child with a disability. They're not allowed to... If that child is in a group home, they're not allowed to visit in that particular area. <coughs> Some of them may have lived experience of disability themselves. Some are students thinking mm. that it looks good on their CV when they're wanting to get a job. So there is a great variety, mm. but you're right, by and large, they are retired folk. In the year 2018-2019, there were 5,527 community visits, and you've said in your recent statement, which is tab 16A, that this is a 5% increase on the previous year. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's enough visits? Is there some suggestion that the community visitors aren't getting out there frequently enough? What's your view well, this about is always, the frequency? This has always been a um, dispute we've had with the Department of Human Services. Um, they, uh, <coughs> I think their view is that um, two visits a year is sufficient and we'd say once a quarter um, is really so four times a year as opposed to two. That's always been a sticking point. But we are in the process of um, developing a new, um, a new community visitor um, model, visiting model, and that is to take into account the significant changes that have arisen because of the introduction of NDIS and all those complications about where community visitors can visit. And um, we are now looking at a, a risk model um, and visit houses that we designate to be most at risk. And that's based on past performance and the problem with that, of course, is that situation in houses can change very rapidly. So I think we're about to hear from two of the community visitors shortly. So Dr Pierce, can I ask you now about some very recent work of mm -hmm. your office? I think only in the last week or so you've published a new report called I'm Too Scared to Come Out of My Room. And uh, you say in this report that the primary focus of the report is your office's ongoing concerns with the group home model and community visitors do see good examples of very good group homes and the availability of high quality group homes. And that's essential to ensure that people with disability are able to realise their right to choice and control. However, for many people, the group home model is not working. And uh, we at the Royal Commission have had an opportunity to read your report, but albeit fairly quickly because we've only recently received it. Is this something that you would like to talk to the Royal Commission about in terms of the findings that form the basis for this report? And also just its title, I'm too scared to come out of my room, rather suggests that there might be some systemic issues hmm. here about that sense of safety in group homes. Sure. Well, um, it is um, recently published on the weekend. I was photocopying it and binding it so you had a copy. <laughs> um, but uh, the report takes us through what are some of the issues with, um, with group homes in quite a bit of detail and makes numerous recommendations. But, uh, and I think I've touched on uh, a number of um, the issues already, um, but I think in order to change violence in group homes, I, as I've said, there's a number of issues, mm. but I really have to go to um, the culture of the organisations um, the, uh, and the fact that boards need to take greater responsibility, the raft of workforce issues um, that I've mentioned, um, and the issue of um, choice and control. Some of those are, are just so fundamental to the problems in group homes. Mm. What, what then, looking at the, the work done in this recent report and thinking forward, what do you say the priorities are for the future? Well, one of the, one of the issues I would really like to see is um, com community visitors. Um, they are part of the um, NDIA safeguarding framework, but they're not in part of the legislation. So it's, it remains very unclear what the role of community visitors will be going forward. So one of the fundamental changes I'd like to see is the right to um, for community visitors to uh, monitor what happens in 
closed environments, whatever form that is, uh, to be enshrined in legislation. I think that is really critical um, as we move forward that we don't lose um, that fundamental safeguard. Uh, if the Commission please, they are the questions that I wanted to ask unless the Commissioners have got any questions, but there may be a few additional questions with the Chair's leave. Yes, yes. Commissioner McEwen has a question. Thank, uh, thank you. You've talked a lot about culture. Mm -hmm. How would you describe very broadly in your observation, what is the culture like for people with disability living in the sort of accommodation and home situation that you've described? I think, um, you, you, uh, I know you won't have had a chance to read um, my report from top to bottom, but the thing that I found so astounding in that report was the level of disempowerment. Um, people are really disempowered in that environment uh, around um, the ability to, uh, that they think, um, well, management decides where I live. I'm too scared to come out of my room. So this incredible disempowerment. So part of the solution to the culture is, um, is as I said, the board's recognising um, the role of people with a disability in, in services um, that they provide. But we have to go back to looking at um, peer support, peer education, um, and um, advocacy is the fundamental building blocks to addressing that um, a disempowerment. It's just so pervasive in all of the comments that we read is this disempowerment. Um, and sometimes I think a sense of hopelessness. One of the points you. you've made in your report and in your evidence is that uh, there are everyday events that uh, from the uh, service providers might perspective might be terribly important, but yet from the perspective of the person with disability, the resident, are reflective of this lack of empowerment. And I, I noticed in paragraph 62 you gave some examples of that. Would, would you like just to comment on those examples? Because in a way they seem to be emblematic of uh, the point you've been making. Uh, yes. Well, um you see, for community visitors, uh, it's what gets into a category one or a reportable incidents. And many of these issues, which we would not tolerate. Can you um, just, because I, I don't think we've mentioned them specifically. Uh, would okay, you like to mention them? So um, the examples I give at point 62, a person has to use a bucket instead of a toilet as there's no chair to go over the toilet. This goes on for many months. A person needs two staff to get her out of bed at night because of the way the house staff roster is managed. This must happen before 8pm when the evening shifts begins when there is only one staff member on duty. A person wears the same clothes for two weeks, lacks clean clothes and is not well supported in regard to their continence. The television set of a resident who loves TV and DVDs broke down but was not replaced for many months. These are these human rights I talk about that are close to home in very small <laughs> spaces that you've got to address those issues if you're going to give effect to human rights on a larger scale. Yes, thank you. Yes, did you, you, did you have some questions you wish to Just ask? Just two questions. Yes, please go ahead. Commissioner. Um, Dr Pierce. You, just going back to that issue of advocacy, mm. you haven't talked about supported decision making. Is there anything you'd like to say about the significance of supported decision making in relation to empowerment? Yes. Well, um, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with a Disability, um, Article 12, Equality Before um, the Law, says that um, people um, have the right to make their own decisions and they should be supported um, to do so. So we must start with the uh, presumption of capacity. Um, and um, I'm sorry, Phil, I'm rambling a little bit here, but I think what we see in the group homes is that people aren't supported to make decisions. They're not, capacity isn't, built, isn't being built in them. And um, that's part of the very fundamental issue. And of course, the new um, Guardianship um, and Administration Act, um, at the very heart of that is the presumption of capacity and the need where I am appointed as a guardian to um, assist people to make decisions, to give effect to their wishes uh, and to be involved in implementing those decisions. 
Are you aware of any organisations that currently provide supported decision making for for people with disability? Oh, look, I think um, a number of the advocacy organisations do try and support people with um, disability to make their own decisions. Have, uh, Valid has a supported decision making trial. I think. Um, Disability Justice Australia also has a model of advocacy that supports decision making. Is support decision making something that could be built into the way an organisation operates? Is that one of the ways it could be spread out? Um, most certainly, and that goes to the heart of the cultural issues that I keep coming back to um, and the empowerment of the individual. Um, and I think that would be uh, very easy for boards of governance to look at how they do support residents to make their own decisions um, in matters that are relevant to themselves. In relation to the culture issue, you said that culture was the responsibility or comes from the board. How does a board get that to actually flow through an organisation? Well, that can be difficult, but it is about, um, firstly, um, ensuring that their culture is, um, or their vision, uh, which sets out what the culture will be, um, is um, in all of their documents, in all of their practice guidelines, in all of their policies, in all of their procedures, uh, in the way they approach their work, uh, in how they treat their workforce, how they treat their residents. So. Um, but you can put all of that material, as we've heard um, earlier in the day, uh, into documents and still have a culture that is, is very poor. And that's why I keep coming back to it's this empowerment issue, the empowerment of people with uh, a disability, supporting them to make their own decisions, and um, that bottom-up approach that I keep talking about. They have to be front and centre to any reform, and while they're not, I don't think you can change the culture. I'm sorry, Phil, and one last thing is that um, it's the monitoring, it's the reporting um, back to the board, the board being aware of what actually happens in their organisation and that they have mechanisms in place that um, uh, attest to the quality of the organisation that is and can be verified. I have no further questions. Your last question is a question that a lot of people in this country are asking, not necessarily <laughs> in relation just to people with disability. All right, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Pierce, for your uh, evidence and uh, for the clear way in which you have um, put it forward. Thank you very much. Ms. Eastman, what yes. happens now? What happens now is we have a, a small panel. So we have two community visitors if uh, it would be convenient to the Commission to have, uh, again, I'll use a tiny break, just so we can assemble the panel and um, for everyone's comfort. And once we have our tiny panel in place, how long will it take, do you think? Uh, I think we might be about half an hour or okay. so. So if we take, take our little break now, we'll come back and we should uh, then expect to finish for today about between 4 and 4.15. Yes, thank right. you. Thank you very much.
The Royal Commission is now in session. Second, we have two witnesses, Cindy Masterson and David Roche. You will find Ms Masterson's statement behind tab 25 in the bundle. And Mr Roche's statement is behind tab 22 with some accompanying material at 23 and 24. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today. We'll ask you to take either the oath or the affirmation as appropriate. Thank you very much. Please stand and face the Commission and repeat after me. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Ms. Masters. God, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence that I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Ms. Marston. Please, please sit down. And now Ms. Eastman will ask you some questions. Right, so, Mr. Roche, I'll start with you. Your name is David Roche. Correct. And you're a community visitor. Correct. And you've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission. I have. And the contents are true and correct. Oh, There's I, one matter you wanted to clarify, yeah, just though. Just one matter that I'd like to clarify, and if Certainly. I make a statement. Although I may not have witnessed firsthand some of the matters in my statement, information about these occurring are included in the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry into Abuse and Disabli in Disability, Ombudsman Victoria Investigation Reports into both Abuse and Incident Reporting, the Office of the Public Advocates community visitors program annual reports that, that include comprehensive information about what is actually happening on the ground, including st case studies, and discussions with and information from other CVs, some of which is contained in the CVP annual report. Thank you. And you have been a community visitor for 15 years. Correct. And what are the areas of Victoria that you cover? Uh, mainly Gippsland and uh, South Gippsland, but that includes places like Leangatha, Warrigal, uh, Maui, Wanthaggy, uh, Yarram. What have I left out? Um, but they, they are some of the places. Now, Ms Masterson, you're, you're Cindy Masterson. Yes. You are also a community visitor. Mm -hmm. You have prepared a statement for the Royal Commission. I have. And its contents are true and correct. And you've been a community visitor for three years. And what areas of Victoria do you cover? Um, I look after Western Metro, which is in a sort of city western area. So out as far as Werribee, Melton, but in um, Williamstown, Yarraville, Fitzgray, around that area. So that district. Right. So for the first thing I wanted to ask both of you, and you can take turns if you wish in answering, is just to help the Royal Commission have a little understanding about the nature of your role. And I think you've been present at the hearing this afternoon when Dr Pearce has given some evidence. So she's spoken about part of your role. But for each of you, can you tell the Royal Commission a little bit about what your particular role is? and then how that sort of operates in a, a practical setting. So who would like to go first? Uh, basically, as the uh, public advocate has indicated, we're independent volunteers, and we do go into group homes to uh, inquire and observe uh, what's happening in the group homes. Uh, part of uh, that includes uh, accessing information that the, uh, the homes may have in respect of the, uh, the residents. Uh, I like to approach it from a, a personal viewpoint of uh, in making those an inquiry, inquiries and observing, uh, w asking the question, would I like to actually live in that in that home? Mm. So that's the approach that you take that's when you go the into approach the approach I would home. take. I take. And yeah, just in addition, we're um, members of the local community, so we go in there as members of the local community and with our own life experience ourselves and community experience and we sort of monitor the group homes and look at the group homes from that perspective as someone in the general community what I see is that reasonable um, and have those people in the group home got the same rights access choices that I would have as a member of the general community so I look at it from that perspective. 
And, and for both of you, what training did you have to become a community visitor? Uh, in my instance, it was making an application to the uh, community visitors program, being interviewed. That takes it back to its very, uh, uh, very basis. There is introductory training before you go out into the, into the field. There's also um, 10 hours of now 10 hours of um, uh, visiting with a, a trained trained visitor. Uh, there's also uh, refresher training before uh, one is reappointed uh, every three years. And there's also an ongoing program of uh, uh, in a, a training a program that the, uh, the, 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 pro the program has. But there has been uh, specific uh, training such as uh, training that's uh, currently running and that's about uh, detecting abuse and uh, violence in group homes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, similar induction training, um, due the 10 hours of visiting. Part of that now is we have a uh, trainee booklet that each um, trainee gets given when they finish the induction training and they, they take that on each of their visits and it's more of a reflective tool as to what they're seeing, what they're doing and the more senior CV that they're going, community visitor that they're going out with um, gets to give them some feedback in that and look at some maybe things they might want to look at more at maybe next visit if they haven't seen things. So there's a bit more of a structure to that pathway of the trainee community visitor now. Um, and then you do your stream specifics as in your disability training um, and you go out then yeah. as your CV. There's other, um, OPRA offers uh, a lot of um, other training as they come along, like re um, a couple of years ago there was Scope had communication aids, um, how do you use communication aids and things um, with residents and we were certainly encouraged as community visitors to take up that training if we possibly could get there. Um, there's different training that goes, there's good group homes training, looking at best practice that we should be looking for in group homes. Um, so CVs are encouraged to attend those kind of extra training courses as well. So the, the training with the, the communication aids are some training about communication techniques <coughs> with people with intellectual disability or people who are non-verbal, is yes, that right? Yes, people who are non-verbal, so um, whether it be <coughs> using boards or pitches and how we can communicate better with them as a community visitor when we go into the houses and visit. All right. When uh, we asked you to prepare some statements for the Royal Commission, we asked you to focus on particular issues and trends that you've observed in your roles, respectively, over 15 and three years. So I wonder what just run through a few of them. And the first one that you both identified was the reporting of incidents and getting access to information around incidents when you uh, undertake your home visits. So I think. Uh, these are uh, for Ms Masterson in paragraph 21 and for Mr Roche in 7.2. Do you want to talk about what your experience has been when you've undertaken a visit and part of your role is to look at the group home records or incident reports? What's been your experience of being able to access documents of that kind? Uh, in some instances it's been very difficult. Uh, there are occasions when incident reports are not available uh, or staff are unable, unable to lo locate them. Uh, the, there's also, to me, a trend that some of the incidents that we think might be in, uh, should be included as incident reports, such as pushing and uh, yelling and punching and stuff like that, uh, may be recorded in a day book, but it isn't recorded necessarily in a, uh, as an incident report. Uh, what does have to be included in an incident report and to whom does the incident report go? Well, the, the, the incident report would go to management. But what has to be included on your understanding in an incident report? Well, I think it, in, anything that um, uh, caused or... Oh, I'm just trying to think, really. It, it, it's anything that would harm the resident. Uh, not necessarily a high level incident such as an assault or, or um, hospitalisation. <coughs> and yeah, so any, for me it's anything that could harm or, or could cause harm to somebody. Um, and often that, yeah, you, it, you really have to be a bit of a detective when you go there and you talk to staff, you talk to residents and someone might 
vaguely mention something and then you'll go back and try and find it in the incident reports um, and you often don't find it or you don't have access to even getting into the incident reports. Sometimes you know, you'll find it in the daily notes that someone's mentioned something. You know, I had one incident where you know um, one of the residents had banged his head against a window to the extent he'd smashed the window with his head and yet that wasn't reported, that wasn't considered an incident because that was kind of normal behaviour for him. So um, it wasn't documented anywhere um, other than I found it in the daily note way back. Um, so things like that is very difficult. Um, every, because we have so many service providers now as well with the group homes, um, they all, a lot of them all operate different systems, incident reporting systems, so it's not a standardised system across the board either. Um, most, they're all moving towards a computerised system rather than a paper-based system as well. Quite often community visitors don't have access to the computer <coughs> system um, and they, some places certainly will give us um, uh, login things, but often too what I find is the staff themselves don't have access to the computerised system, um, which begs to wonder where, how they actually access, access them anyway. Um, but often too, um, a lot of the system, the risk man system for instance, um, they can only, the staff member can only access one, the incidents that they've submitted, any other instance, incident that has occurred in that house, they can't actually see. So. Uh, my my thinking to that is that the system is a little bit flawed because the whole purpose of seeing an incident is to try and do something about it, make sure it doesn't happen again. So if staff aren't even aware, how is that helping? So, and how have you both found? So can I ask? So can I ask just how seriously do you think management takes the approach and culture of incident reporting to the with the view of making sure if something has happened that has caused or potentially have caused harm to a resident. What, how would you, what's your, in your observation, how would you describe how seriously management take it? In my view, definitely not seriously enough because quite often in the incident reports that I do get to see, the um, uh, outcome or the management of the incident, that, that part of the incident report is, isn't even filled in. So the incident is, might be documented, but there's no, what have we done about that, um, even filled in in the report. So suggests that it's not to me. Can I just add there too that my understanding is that um, even the classification of what what is a major or a non-major or a critical or non-critical incident is not well understood by the staff either. Uh, and if you, I think it was comments made by the Victorian Om Ombudsman that the, uh, the resident is not at the centre of the process. The process is the prime uh, driver of doing it to get the process right rather than focusing on the care of the, the, the resident in the house who may be, have been affected by the, by the incident. Um, the other part of that, I think the, the Ombudsman had also commented the fact that the, the whole uh, incident reporting uh, was fragmented, confused and not understood well. So I want to ask you about the reporting of incidents. So have you had occasion on your visits where the residents in the group homes have told you about an incident that you haven't been able to find in any report or the like? Has, have you had occasions like that? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in one case, a resident uh, expressed the view that uh, he'd like to move. Uh, because of uh, he was being bullied and the staff were favouring the, the other residents uh, and that wasn't recorded in an incident report. Mm -hmm. yes, had any and I've definitely had even just the, the window, the broken window, with yeah. th that was a resident who had told me about that. So. And, and when you're undertaking the visit, do you engage with the staff uh, about those sorts of matters while you're on the visit or is it something that you write in your report and it comes back later on? How do you manage well, that? Well, actually, I rely on the staff to provide uh, yeah, a certain level of information uh, on the basis that there is uh, a trusting relationship between the CVs and staff. Uh, however, it, it must remain independent because the staff are the ones that know the residents best. Uh, and they're the, really the primary carers of the, 
the residents. And they, the logical first, pe uh, you know, the first people to go go to if you observe something that you might think is a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, somebody may have suffered an injury, may have had a broken arm, which uh, it may have had a broken arm. Well, you'd inquire into that and you'd ask the staff, well, okay, what's happened? Now, what's being done about it? And it may be uh, that the, the resident's been taken to hospital, you'll form a view that the resident's been cared for, uh, and you may not report that. But you'd, you'd report that a resident did have a broken arm. And in terms of your engagement with the staff, have they, in your experience, generally been cooperative with you? Have they been open and transparent in the issues that arise in the home? Uh, over the, and this is the benefit, I suppose, of visiting over a number of years. In some cases, yes, because the staff have been there for a number of, number of years and there has been a relationship built up between the CVs and the staff. And they're quite open about what is happening in the house, what the guys are doing, uh, what's happened, uh, whether whether or not there have been incidents, um, and they're quite open about doing that. On other occasions, you might walk into a house and you'll feel as though, I'm not sure whether the staff are being quite as open as we'd like them to be about what's happening in the house. Yeah, um, sure. I find a lot of the houses too, um, more and more so it seems, there might be casual staff on as well who, you know, they don't know what's occurred or they don't know the residents. It might be their first time in the house ever. So getting any information out of them is almost impossible. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess that makes it makes it more difficult if that's the case. Yeah. Well, you, you both uh, referred in your respective statements to the staffing issues and you've both raised that question of consistency of staff and also the sort of high level of casual staff working in group homes. Can you help us understand why that's a matter of concern to you? What is it about a high number of casual staff versus more permanent staff that makes a difference from the from your perspective and the visits that you've undertaken? Well, from a being a casual, I don't think that you know the resident well. Because if you're a permanent and you've been there for a number of years, you've got a better idea of what the needs are of the, uh, of the resident. Yeah, and often the casuals are quite transient. Yeah. Um, so they don't have a lot of training. They don't even sometimes have much of an induction. So it's very, very difficult. And like, and as a person, you know, these people are doing some very personal cares with a lot of these people in these homes. So, you know, doing showering and toileting and, you know, it can't possibly be comforting for them to have some stranger coming into their house. It would be much easier having someone who they're familiar with and who's, who knows them and knows their routine. So it kind of, you know, it's obviously a lot better. My understanding is, yeah, there's more and more casuals as we come. Um, DHHS are putting out a whole heap of redundancies, they're telling me, so a lot of the houses at the moment are quite worried that a lot of the permanent staff that have been around for quite a few years within the group home system are about to take, there's about 500 of them taking redundancies yeah. out the door, so there's going to be a lot of casual staff coming in, it would seem. What about the, the higher level of manager in a group home? So there might be the support workers, they might be casual, but what about the house manager, the person responsible for the management of the house. What's been your experience in terms of a person in that position? That's probably best illustrated by the time it takes to uh, receive responses to incident reports. Why is that? Um, because they, the incident reports or the responses to the incident reports is, will usually be done by management. They won't be by, done by the staff that uh, uh, that you're t uh, talking to or uh, you're talking to at a uh, at a visit. Now there is a requirement that um, the CVs reports are responded to. I think it's within 21 days. Uh, and it's my understanding that that doesn't, that doesn't happen. So that probably uh, gives an indication that in some instances the regard for the CVs uh, 
and the processes surrounding those are not held in terribly high regard by some of the managers. Yeah, I find certainly in a lot of my houses, um, there's quite a high turnover of man house managers um, in, in, some of, in some of the houses. Um, in other houses, you, you know, where you have the more stable house manager, the, the house manager that's more present in the house as well, I, I often find they're my better houses that I go to, that um, things seem to be running better. You've got a house manager that's present and the staff are seeing them actively supporting the residents, so they seem to do the same and it all seems to work a, a lot better. There's a lot of houses now that have um, one house manager that might be responsible for at least two or three group homes. And so there's limited time, obviously, that they're spending at the individual houses. And in those houses, you tend to get um, less responses or the responses to our issues that we bring up are quite generic, as in, you know, it, you don't really get a, a very proper mm -hmm. answer. So I want to turn now to... Uh, Sorry, see. can I... There does seem to be something, if I may say so, of a uh, potential contradiction between trusting the staff and the kind of responses you're <laughs> suggesting you actually get, which are anything but deserving of trust. So how far can you actually trust the people that uh, you're su are supposed to be supervising in That's a way? That's a very good point. My, my, um my take on that is, um, so whenever every issue we raise gets put into our database, into the OPA database, um, and then when we go back next time to the vi um, next time to the visit, we need to check that off as well. So we raise the, all the issues; they respond within 21 days. Often they'll say, "Yes, um, yeah, that's definitely been done and that's been fixed." Whatever, as the um, the team leader who then is meant to close off that issue, I would never close that off that issue off from the response. I will wait to my community visitors go back into the house next time and confirm for me that that issue has been confirmed and then I will close off that issue for that reason like there is sometimes often the house manager or the person responding they might have a good intention but it hasn't actually happened can I ask about this casualization of the workforce I was thinking as you were saying it what would it be like if in schools children got a new teacher every day yeah. How, how would a teacher ever get to know a child and what the child needs and what the educational needs are? What's the driver of this casualisation? Is it happening more? Is there something that's driving it? What, what's the model that is causing the casualisation of the workforce? Um, I suppose, and I don't know much about business models, but I suppose that the uh, but the crux of it is that um, there is a limited amount of resources and uh, whatever needs to be done has to be fitted into that limited amount of resources. Now, going into the NDIS, um, where there is choice and I think there is a certain amount of uh, private enterprise or more private enterprise involvement in that, uh, the profit motive will probably become greater and I think that if um, there can be cost savings through casualisation of the staff, well, that may very well be the case. Uh, in the time remaining, I want to see if we can get a picture of what it's like inside a group home through your eyes. So, Ms Masterson, in your statement, you talk about the condition of the houses and your statement focuses on issues such as the maintenance of houses, the lack of renovation, some of the repairs. And Mr Roche, you haven't focused on that as much. And so I want to ask you whether is this a, a, a country city issue or what's been your experience both in terms of the, the state and the quality of housing? Uh, the, the, the state and quality of the houses varies. Um, there are some uh, new homes that have been uh, constructed, built that I visit. There are also some older homes that uh, I've visited over a number of years as well. Um, and some of those homes I'd consider to be a less desirable uh, residence re uh, and probably in a less desirable lo location, even though it's in a, uh, a rural area. There is still an element of isolation and perhaps a degree of stigma about the, the houses. 
Yeah, in my homes, there's certainly yeah, some that have been purpose built. A lot of them are just a, a house in the suburbs. Um, uh, some are very old, some are a lot newer. My, one of the things I bring up though is these the maintenance and the mm. issue of maintenance and how timely that maintenance is and, and how um, the workmanship that we find, seem to find acceptable a lot of the times, like very basic things in a lot of these houses like a light fitting, where, you know, a CV will report it and six months later that light fitting is still being reported as not being fixed. A really noisy heater, for instance, I, I um, put in my statement that, you know, we're keeping residents awake at night so it's been two winters now and you know, more than 12 months and the really noisy heater is still happening even though it's being reported. And there are things to me that just go to the overall neglect of, like I wouldn't accept that in my house if I was losing sleep over a noisy heater or a, a light switch that didn't work that was unsafe. You know, it left for more than six months. You know, it just, it's not acceptable and we just, it just seems to be, it's all too hard like the noisy heater, it's come back and from, housing that uh, it's it's quite a big job that's been the only response so far um, renovations that occur to the houses i have one house that they put in a second sink so that the residents there's four out of the five residents are in wheelchairs they put in a second sink so that the residents in the wheelchairs could access the sink and help with meal preparation and clean up and things that was all fantastic but when they put the second sink in they've put a big fascia board across the front so there's no access for wheelchairs to that second sink but somehow somebody has signed off on that and when I keep asking what's happening, what's happening, it's like th there is, um, it's come back that there's, there'll be no more um, work done on this house, the money's been spent, that's the end of it. And it's like, well, it's completely useless and it's a blatant misuse of funds as well, if nothing else. But you know, so none of those residents get to actually help with meals in their own home. And what happened? Did you report on this? I still keep reporting. Uh, it's still ongoing. Um, it, it has a... Do you want us to make it the first recommendation <laughs> of the commission? <laughs> to fix the sink in the, the house. I'll give you the address. Facial board be taken off. <laughs> that's right. Um, you know, but even that to that, the house manager there, that's had multiple yeah. house managers yeah. through that house. Right. So things have just got missed. And the latest response from that house manager was, I was not even aware of the sink. He only has to walk into the house and talk uh, to the Really, what I'm interested in is what you can do about it. This is just a matter of you I can agitating with who happens to, whoever happens to be the manager at every that, given that's time. That's really, and I can put it into my reports. It goes into the reports. It hopefully goes into the OPA annual report. Hopefully somebody with some nows will read it and hopefully something might get done. But it, it goes towards the trends that go with the OPA, the annual report that we can't... We, we report on each year. Maybe someone could buy them a screwdriver. Maybe. I've thought about it myself. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I just make... Uh, to me, there is an issue around the escalation processes and how you actually move mm. something, I'll say down here, up to there, to actually get anything uh, done about it. Uh, the best that we, as community visit, we're, we're not really the solvers of the problem. We're the <laughs> identifiers of the problems uh, and the reporters of the problems. We can report that in the annual report to Parliament. Uh, the response to that is sometimes very problematic. Uh, there is a community visitors board that has a power under legislation to virtually uh, refer any matter on to anyone that it wishes to re refer it on to, including the uh, Disability Services Commissioner as a result of the parliamentary inquiry. But it seems to me that to have an, an issue escalated to a point uh, where it might be satisfactorily resolved requires the building of a case uh, that the Office of the Public Advocate is probably not resourced to be able to do. And the public advocate herself um, uh, has no investigation powers or punitive powers to bring people to heal. So as a community visitor, you might see something there that is really, well, it concerns you. It's about the care and dignity of an individual. You will try to escalate it on, but you will come to a point where I'd say nobody's accepting responsibility for producing a result or getting something done. Done. We can get it to a particular uh, point, and that is one of the most f 
frustrating parts of being a community visitor. You know what should be done. I mean, a person in the street like myself knows what should be done. But to get it done is a completely different, it becomes very, very complex. Now, I understood that the Disability Services Commissioner, as a result of the uh, parliamentary inquiry, was to um, uh, be the, sort of the, the last, or the, the organisation that could make a decision and get some things done. I think as community visitors, there may have been 133 uh, cases that the program thought should have been escalated, and I think they were escalated, I think 13 were investigated. Now, that to me, yeah, it, builds to the it builds the frustration in, you know things are wrong, but how do you change it? And we should, we should have the, the systems in place to be able to change it. And the person that misses out is the person that we go and visit. In the time that's available, Sorry. no, uh, <laughs> thank you. No, no, don't you've provided problem. so much information that we haven't had time to explore with both of you this afternoon. But can I just ask you to end on this? What's the one or two things that you think are absolutely key to improving the quality of life and the choices for people with disability living in group homes? You have a community visitors program to the standard of Victoria's across Australia because that's a primary safeguard for people with a disability. If the Royal, oh, the Royal Commission, if the, uh, and it, it's, it's the public advocate mentioned, it's uh, sort of absent in the NDIS and in Victoria, if the CV program is lost, one of the fundamental protections for people with disability <coughs> will also be lost, and I just think that's wrong. Uh, yeah, uh, independent oversight. It doesn't matter what you call it, whether it's a community visitor program, but having some sort of independent oversight going into those, they're, they're quite closed environments, so having someone go in there and check on what's the, some checks and balances in there. Um, but the other thing I would think is um, the incident reporting system. The whole is so flawed at the moment. It needs to be somehow standardised and mandated, and that includes training <coughs> staff to recognise what an incident actually is and understanding that um, and being able to report it. That, to me, having that is the, one of the most important things. I think mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner McEwen had a question. I have just one question. In the, with the people with disabilities you've met over the years that you've been with this program, what level or what understanding and knowledge do they demonstrate of their human rights and how to enforce those human rights? For a lot of the people that I see, they are quite complex needs, yes. people with intellectual disabilities, and so I don't really believe that their understanding of their, they don't have a very good understanding of their human rights. So all the more reason that we need to look after that. Do, do, do you talk to them about their human rights? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, we talk, yeah, talk to them about what they, just the basics of what they want. Are they happy where they are? Well, how we, you know, could, what could we do to make an improvement? You've been on a holiday. You know, when was the last time you went on a holiday? Just basic things that we all take for granted and we try and talk to them about those kind of things. Thank you. There's nothing more. So that that concludes the evidence of our two community visitors, and we thank them very much for their contribution Mr. Rogan, today. Mr. Masters, thank you very much for coming and giving evidence and giving us the benefit of your insights. We do appreciate it. Thank you. There's one final matter before we conclude, yes. and that is that the Commonwealth has very uh, kindly provided us a report from the Australian Bureau of Statistics today. I was just going to ask Ms Munro to explain the document which we will provide to the Commissioners now. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. We heard evidence today in relation to the Personal Safety Survey and there was a question asked by Council Assisting around a lack of data and then an exchange between yourself, Chair, and the witness about 
some questions around gaps and how those yeah. gaps can be filled. This is a document that has only been today finalised by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. It's titled Disability and Violence in Australia Personal Safety Survey. <clears throat> what this report does is identify how people with disabilities data is captured in that survey. It also recognises that there are potentially some gaps in the way in which that data is collected, but explains what is done in an attempt to capture that data. <clears throat> and it also usefully identifies whether there are learnings from international national statistical offices. It's a six page document that we'd seek to tender today. Thank you. Well, Thank you. So, Commissioners, we have <coughs> copies which we'll make available to you and we'll include in the tender bundle if that's convenient overnight. Yes. Thank you, Ms Munro, for that. Otherwise, that concludes the proceedings today. All right, thank you. Uh, we will then adjourn until 10 a.m. Uh, yes. tomorrow uh, when we will resume with uh, evidence. Again, thank you for coming and giving evidence. We'll now adjourn. Thank you.